Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, watching. For anybody watching at, at home, this is the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. Today is Wednesday, June 15, 2022. Um, my name is Gordon McNeely. I'm the chair of, uh, of this committee and uh, members. We have members here today uh, Mark McLean, uh, Zach Bell, Rob Henderson, Michelle Beaton, Carlo Bernard, and visiting uh, with us is Ola Hammerland. Um, so, can I get a, a motion to adopt the agenda? Uh, Carla Bernard. Um, so we have a, a lengthy day, but a very interesting and, and two incredibly important topics. So we'd like to thank our guests for, for coming in. Um, what we'll do is we'll we'll save more or less save questions if we can to afterwards. I'll take clarification questions at the beginning. Um, but we have we do have a bit of time for this presentation, so um, we will. Uh, I'll, I'll try to manage time accordingly and make sure the committee's uh, questions get heard accordingly. So, what I'll do is I'll pass it over to our guests, and we'll start maybe with the minister, so you can introduce yourself for Hansard, um, and then uh, can carry on with your presentation. So, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, introduction for Hansard Ernie Hudson, Minister of Health and Wellness. But again, Chair, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity for uh, myself and uh, uh, professionals from uh, my staff to appear uh, here before a standing committee uh, this afternoon. I think, uh, you know, you had mentioned, Chair, that there will be two presentations, one with regard to mental health and addictions, uh, second one subsequent to this to long-term care. I think that uh, on both of them, that I'll speak specifically to our first presentation, that you will see that there has been uh, a substantial amount of work carried out by both uh, uh, staff in health and wellness and health PEI, uh, certainly in collaboration and uh, partnership with some of our community partners. And I uh, want to take the opportunity as well, Chair, to. Uh, uh, thank the great team of dedicated staff at both Health and Wellness and Health PEI for the work that they have done. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon with uh, the three staff members from uh, Mental Health and Addictions, Joanne Donahue, Dr. Jacqueline Goodwin, and Dr. Javier Salaberria. So with that, Chair, I will turn it over to uh, staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you're starting with me. My name is Joanne Donahoe. I'm yeah. the Executive Director of Mental Health and Addictions. And um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to provide an update on our uh, to the Standing Committee on our, our program, Mental Health and Addictions. So next slide. <laughs> He's my banner. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Mental Health and Addictions, we ground our, our day literally every day in, in the vision that was developed by the group with master planning. And it's really all people living in PEI will have an equal opportunity to achieve and maintain the best possible mental health um, throughout their lifetime. So we provide services across the spectrum. The mental health and addiction uh, is grounded in the concept of community first. And that community first concept really speaks to um, the, the need to uh, develop that integrated continuum of care of service delivery so as clients move from acute to community or, or community mental health to an acute episode that that transition in care is smooth. Uh, an interdisciplinary care delivery model across providers. I'm very, we're very fortunate in mental health and addictions that we have such a, a broad spectrum of psychologists, psychiatrists, OT, OTAs, um, uh, occupational therapists, I'm sorry, occupational therapy assistants, uh, social service workers, all working together in a team environment to support the well-being uh, of the of the clients and, and to support them in their most vulnerable time in their lives sometimes and, and in their recovery. And so finally, um, not finally, but also we, we speak to the, the need for supporting technologies like we are in, in 2022. And so we're working very hard on secured funding to update our technology to a much more modernized um, documentation system uh, to work very integrated with our primary care providers. And it's, um, and we'll, so we're starting that rollout. And big part of that is that it reduces 
places a documentation burden for our clients and our staff providers. And so um, we'll, we're developing uh, virtual care. Um, we've developed uh, and we'll be rolling out a new EMR, uh, rolling out um, a, a different module, supported module for the acute care environment to be much more uh, specific to the needs of a mental health uh, acute care stay. And also we've uh, rolled out the Bridge the Gap platform to support uh, health promotion, resource access, um, and different supporting technologies as such as that. We're um, most, and then most importantly, we're doing major redesign across all our province uh, to optimally design spaces. Really, then the end result is really to have enable the right care close to home at the right time by the right providers, so that we know that our clinic, our clients, and our patients do the best um, when they're supported in their own home community by the people that know them and understand some of the challenges that they experience. Um, as certainly it's tempting to focus on, on acute care and that, that um, on the top of the pyramid um, because that's where the model, it, it really is where people are most acute and where you often hear the most uh, difficult uh, situations. But we know that in order to be successful, we really have to build out that bottom platform of the in the community on the foundation so that our program really stays strong. And so that's really reducing our reliance on that complex inpatient care and be more focused on, on the base. And without that foundation, shifting the focus focus to the care closer to home, the new campus will quickly become over capacity and we're very well aware of that. So that's why we've rolled out uh, Bridge the Gap. Strongest Families, we recently received funding for that. It um, supports you know, young children and their parents um, for with, with on virtual care through a virtual platform. And um, we've had great success there. Um, early intervention and intervention, we're very much focusing on our community mental health team, working with integrated primary care in the shared space, using shared technology, using shared uh, opportunities to uh, on complex cases, on, on smooth referrals back and forth. Then we're working very, and have already rolled out um, uh, mental health, solidified the funding for um, walk-in clinics, um, um, Jackie's program, the Insight program, our community outreach, our seniors mental health, all of those programs are, are rolled out or in various stages for the most part rolled out across the province so that, that's uh, again building on the platform close to home. And then we're moving to more intensive outpatient care, and that's our addiction transition program, as well as mental health structured program, but I'll be uh, outlining in a little bit more detail what those are all about. And finally, of course, is the acute care inpatient stay and, and building the strength of the, the bench strength of that program as well with our providers. So really focusing health promotion, early intervention, and care in the community, providing that, that base. In our community health centers, um, I, I spoke to that earlier, it's really providing that integrated care with our providers to um, have access to care they need with a very close collaboration and, and uh, working in proximity with our providers, our primary care providers, and collaborating on complex cases and supporting individuals in their own community. Um, so but that partnership is well underway um, and actually in Alberton our com first community health centre is under construction. Our second one they're working on design and anticipated that it will open in uh, estimated 23-24, Charlottetown estimated 24-25 and Montague is still to be determined the actual timeline for that date. So I've mentioned again pro community programming, but it's also we've invested in and have um, a mental health and addictions patient navigator. Her name is Kaylee Knox, and she has been a great support to many of you in supporting our clients, but also um, into our clients and their families and their loved ones who are looking for the support they need. We've built um, a, a great deal of investment in our child and youth services, our student well-being teams, the Insight Program, the Children's Counseling, Group Therapy, um, all of those investments are starting to pay dividends in terms of access. 
um, virtual services like the platform for accessing um, not only our own uh, resources that are available locally, but also some uh, platforms that you can be held virtually, or if you just want to go at your own pace in terms of self-learning, those resources are on Bridge the Gap as well. Strongest Families is, uh, as I've mentioned, is an excellent support to us, getting great results for our children and, our, and their family members. And we have actual, uh, excellent telehealth. Um, our psychiatrists uh, use telehealth to be able to provide services across the province. Um, even though they may be located in Charlottetown, it gets ready access to that service. And during COVID, but um, we, we accessed a lot of uh, telehealth in, in terms of virtual care to be able to continue to provide service for those clients who weren't comfortable coming into the office. A Zoom call was, was initiated um, with clients and their families. So all of that um, uh, program and build has been happening. So then um, the mixed juice campus, as all of uh, three parties have endorsed, and, and I am grateful to all of you in terms of uh, optimizing the treatment spaces for our clients. So the first one um, is, there's one, two, three, four that are underway right now at various stages. So I'll just walk through quickly, um, given the time that each one of them. So our addictions extended care. This program is designed for females uh, identifying clients age 18 plus um, for, to support them in uh, their recovery and maintain sobriety and that program is open and um, it has six it moved from six to 12 treatment spaces and it has also four day treatment spaces um, it includes full day and evening programming and essentially supportive programming and maintaining their recovery a typical day is a 90 day stay um, it's open june 2022 and uh, all reports are that clients and staff are very happy with the facility and and are, and are quite uh, uh, ha um, pleased to be in that site. The Structured Mental Health Program, it's a new mixed gender population for adults 18 plus with mental health and co-occurring disorders, uh, addictions. Um, and it's for those clients that have depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, any of those newly diagnosed and so getting those diagnoses can be quite challenging and so this 28-day program um, supports the individual to learn more about um, their illness and their symptoms and it um, provides some support in, in terms of life skills and building and budgeting, job seeking, further education, um, linking them to, to those opportunities in the community. And the goal again is once again to, as a community first philosophy, philosophy is to ensure that successful transition back to their own community um, and or to the community of their choice and then to decrease the need for those acute care stays so that they're more resilient and, and have the skills they need to be uh, functioning in the community quite well. Um, and for us, uh, as, a, as a system, it increases patient flow, so that program will, will support that as well. It has eight residential beds, 12-day treatment spaces, and it is uh, anticipated to be open August of this year as well. Um, the next building, the L-shaped one, is a co-located addictions transition unit, which currently operates out of the Provincial Addictions Treatment Center. Um, it's co and it also will include a co-occurring complex mental health program. Um, so again, that program is currently operating out of the Addictions Treatment Center, will be moved over to this space. It has 12 residential, and we will be able to offer four day, day treatment spaces, four week residential uh, program for adults, 18 um, plus, mixed gender. This facility will house the addictions also the addictions this is a new program it's in pilot stage now um, but it will house the addictions intensive day treatment program and this program um, operates for eight outpatient clients at any given time and it's a three-week gender specific intensive day <coughs> program really looking at the root causes of addictions and helping people unpack that um, to help them in their in to to stay well the um, 
the mental health co-occurring complex mental health. So it's co-located at that L-shaped building as well. It's 12 residential beds, approximately 90 to 180 days stay. They are longer stays for sure. And it's for clients with repeat visits or extended periods of time on our inpatient units. And again, it's philosophy of community first out of a, a secure facility into a community space. Again, for those who have complex uh, mental health concerns such as schizophrenia, major depression, uh, co-occurring disorders, client, CCRB clients, potentially housing insecure. Um, and they have challenges experienced with coping with the new diagnosis. And the focus on management of the illness and um, skills, like we have uh, an excellent training calendar, Jackie will speak to this, but for our staff on DBT, CBT, exposure therapy, skill building, like cooking, laundry, all of that, music and art therapy built, will be built into this new facility building connect community connections and supports so that when they transition back to the community, they're equipped with what they need to, to do well. And we anticipate that building will be open 24-25. Um, and as we said, staff are involved in the design of that state right now. And finally, then uh, at the top of that pyramid, of course, uh, of the pyramid I showed you earlier, is our acute care uh, mental health and addiction facility. It's 64 beds as well as 12 partial hospitalization spaces, which Dr. Salabria will speak to in, in more detail. The, it's adults 18 and, and over requiring acute care, as well as our in, inpatient uh, addictions withdrawal management. The flexible, it's designed specifically to be flexible units to support changing needs over time because as you're aware, cl our clients need change over time. Um, new, new drugs come, new uh, issues come and present. And so our 64 bed facility will be designed so that if we have 16 of, of one type of bed, we can change it to, to reduce, uh, to be more mental health if that's needed less on inpatient withdrawal. So that's why the design is, is specific for that. Um, this design process is currently underway. It's multidisciplinary involvement in that design process. Staff are, are giving great input into what it needs to look like from uh, uh, many air aspects of their care delivery. And the target completion date for that is the 26th and 27th. Um, the, I will now turn it over to Dr. Salabria. Thank you for participating today. and. We work very closely as a team, and it's been, been a joy. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Javier Salabre. I'm the Provincial Medical Director for Mental Health and Addictions. And I'll start by thanking everyone for the opportunity to present some what I think is very exciting information uh, in terms of the direction and, uh, and the future of uh, mental health and addictions here on the island. Um, and by the way, I apologize if I cough. I have a little asthmatic. Uh, Allergies, so. <laughs> you're not infecting us oh, right no, now, I, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> <That's wasted. laughs> I tested this morning. <laughs> so, anyhow, so now it's, it's my turn now. So um, if you notice uh, in the presentation so far, there's definitely a theme of um, community first, um, uh, care delivered, um, you know, in the community, locally, um, and um, very importantly, as much as possible outside of the inpatient hospital setting. Um, and many of the new uh, facilities, uh, many of the new programs, and many of the existing programs are really are, um, I think, very appropriately moving towards um, day hospital and partial hospital treatments. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about that, but just kind of keep that in mind um, that that, uh, that is the overall move um, over the course of the next you know, few years um, as we develop this, this campus. Um, before I get into those details, uh, this slide is about um, um, uh, the space at the QEH. Um, Presently, um, you know, the, any, any individual who needs the, uh, an emergency room visit uh, for a psychiatric or mental health issue um, is co-located uh, with the general uh, emergency room uh, stay. Um, so uh, we're actually in the process of, um, of building, uh, in addition to the QEH, uh, which is uh, to the emergency room, and it'll be co-located in the emergency room department. And that's going to provide eight assessment rooms specific for mental health and addictions um, and four short stay beds. Uh, so these are uh, 
um, the beds that are available for admission uh, with uh, uh, patients who we anticipate will only need a short stabilization of you know a day or two or three. <clears throat> so that actually, um, it is my understanding that construction on that will begin um, in the next month or so, and that should be up and running uh, by the, the end of next calendar year if all goes well. And again, in terms of the future state, and this is planning that has been going on for a number of years, uh, the plan for what is um, presently the Unit 9 space um, in the future is actually uh, for the child and youth inpatient unit. Um, and that is intended for individuals between the ages of 8 and 17. And that will be six beds um, with also a partial hospital um, uh, component to it as well. So again, kind of keep that in mind in terms of what the vision is for the future. Um, and again, that was all you know, planned through the master planning that's been going on for a number of years. So um, what, what we are in the process of doing now, in order to, to, to reach that goal of, of um, community first and uh, partial hospitalization uh, day programming, um, you know, we are presently in moving towards that. Um, as uh, Joanne mentioned, you know, these, uh, the, the, the new hospital space will likely not be available for four or five years. Um, we're literally just starting the design phase of that. Um, but more important than the bricks and mortar, in my opinion, is really the programming. Um, so we are, we are working now at um, developing and standing up uh, the programming uh, that will eventually move into the new space. Um, so we are, we're, we're planning now to have the partial hospital program um, up and running um, by the beginning of this fall. And I personally think that that is uh, extremely important. Um, having a, a, a space for intensive psychiatric and mental health treatment um, where you know, they, they receive the intensive treatment that they need yet have the ability to go home for the night, I think is extremely important. Um, you know, again, that goes towards that community uh, first and, 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 you know, maintaining, you know, a, a, as much as possible a normal day and, and, and household responsibilities um, for the patients, you know, that that is appropriate for. Obviously, if someone needs to be in the hospital overnight, you know, that'll be taken care of. Um, but there is a there is a component of uh, of the population that can certainly either step down to that from the hospital, or go directly to the partial hospital program without the need for a hospitalization. So we are working on having that uh, up and running uh, by the beginning of um, the fall. So. Um, in addition, um, the inpatient um, hospitalizations, uh, the, so the inpatient hospital units, um, presently, as we all know, we have uh, an acute unit at the Hillsborough Hospital, and we also have an acute unit um, at, um, uh, on Unit 9 at the QEH, and we have an acute unit at Prince County. I don't want to forget about Prince County, because they're very important as well. <clears throat> the we're, we're planning on consolidating the inpatient units um, in the Charlottetown area, so consolidating the, the units um, from unit, basically Unit 9 into the Hillsborough Hospital. Uh, that affords, um, uh, in my opinion, a, a couple of major benefits. One is, um, you know, all of the acute units, uh, all the acute beds, so to speak, are are in essence in the same place. So that affords uh, streamlining of uh, staffing, certainly, um, but it also provides the ability for staff to collaborate with each other and to make sure that uh, the care that is being um, uh, provided is consistent across the board. Um, that goes for nursing staff, that also goes for psychiatric, uh, for the psychiatrist as well. You know, having colleagues um, that are available um, to bounce ideas off of each other and to um, really discuss cases is, is, is invaluable. And that certainly provides uh, an opportunity where it's a lot easier to have that uh, collaboration. So, you know, certainly it will, it will provide uh, improved uh, staffing, as I mentioned. Um, and with a consolidation, it should really help with um, patient flow um, and 
Um, again, you know, having everything in one area um, just makes it a lot more efficient. So once that is accomplished, um, we can then um, uh, move um, one of the units at the Hillsborough Hospital, a non-acute uh, unit, uh, to the Unit 9 space. Um, and that's going to afford just a larger space, first of all, um, which, which I think is helpful. Um, so that, though, that group can, will be going there. And then that then will afford us um, physical space to physically put the partial to hospital program at the Hillsborough Hospital. So the, hospital, the partial hospital program that I spoke about that, we, that should be up and running uh, by September will be located at the Hillsborough Hospital. Um, and that's a space for 12 uh, patients um, who will receive intensive um, uh, treatment. A, yeah, there we go. Uh, who, who, will, who will receive intensive uh, treatment um, on a daily basis. Usually the partial hospital programs are time limited. Um, you know, eight weeks, 12 weeks, somewhere in that range. Um, and during their time, um, obviously there's an enormous amount of therapy and groups um, and access to nursing staff and, and OT and psychology um, and psychiatric access as well. Um, so that program, as I mentioned a little uh, a few minutes ago, really affords um, excellent care um, in a setting that is not an inpatient setting. So there, there are many individuals who will benefit from this um, and receive the intensive care that they need, yet be able to go back home um, at the end of the day and take care of things that they need to take care of. We all have responsibilities at home. So um, that's going to really. Uh, sorry, yep. Doctor. Um, we're just going to ask um, <clears throat> Michelle one of the clarification questions. So. Sure. Yeah, I'm just looking back at the announcement last month uh -huh. on May 10th about the um, the division to introduce the new 12. Is that what we're talking about here? What you said is going to be ready in fall? Yes. The partial? The so, partial hospital, yes. Okay, so in the announcement last mm -hmm. month it said that it would be ready by the end of the end of June or starting by the end of June so does that mean that we pushed that out a couple of months is that what's happened there or is that how long that transition will take that's the transitional time for all the <coughs> physical moves right. that have okay. to happen of, of clients and patients to different units and then the, the next move is to stand up then because then we'll have the space okay. to stand up the partial hospitalization okay I appreciate yeah. that thank you I'm good sure. thank okay. you doctor no problem so going back to the uh, partial hospital, um, you know, so, you know, just again to clarify, if all goes well by September-ish or so, early fall. Um, so that program will be up and going. Um, and as I said before, um, really that's going to make a huge difference in terms of the flow of patients uh, through our division and the flow of patients uh, in terms of, you know, what kind of um, care they require. Um, so certainly, you know, inpatient care, if that's necessary, that's available. And if all goes well, should really be more available um, because of the flow, increased uh, flow um, to more appropriate levels of care. Um, you know, obviously we have outpatient services, um, which um, are not, by definition, all that intensive. So what we're, we're, we're missing um, at this point in time is really that, that middle uh, period that middle ground in terms of intensive treatment that is not in a hospital setting, which this will um, fill that gap. Um, I'll go back. For a so, <laughs> so that so that pretty much kind of sums up the the partial hospital program and the the moves. So again, just to just to finish up uh, my part of the presentation. Um, you know, the, the goal here is really to provide the appropriate level of, of care for the individual, whatever is necessary for that individual, and to have those services available um, for that individual um, as close as possible to the community um, and outside of the hospital setting. Um, since, um, you know, our goal is and, and should be and will continue to be um, that individuals belong in the community, 
treatment should be in the community. Um, and, you know, we provide all the supports that are necessary to have folks um, really thrive and, and be successful um, in the community in their day-to-day -day life. You guys going to work the button? Yeah, I'll work the button for you. <laughs> um, so I was asked to deal with kind of the last two questions that the committee asked me to present on, and that is what's uh, kind of our knowledge around what the impact of COVID has been uh, in our populations, and also to speak briefly to what it is that our uh, mental health uh, research intervention innovation, sorry, and education division do quickly. So I'm going to run through a little bit of that, but I'm happy to take questions if people need clarification of points. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so obviously talking about what's COVID done to us in our communities, in our country, internationally is a large scale question. And this is a phenomenon that's only been really happening for the last two years. So the science has to catch up to the phenomenon as well, right? Um, very early on in the first wave of the pandemic, there, we saw a, a great article come out in The American Psychologist, which was encouraging psychologists to consider what might be some of the areas of risk as this pandemic developed. And a way to look at how does a stressor affect us as humans is what developmental level we're at. So this slide here today talks about some of the impacts we could maybe predict might be important as we're thinking about development and risk. And, uh, you know, maybe as we go through this, you may want to reflect on your own lives and your own place in development and have you seen any of these things happen. So when we talk about children, obviously early childhood uh, and elementary school age, for example, you know, daily routine is important at that developmental level. And also understanding who, who are the important people in our lives and what do they do. And if that gets interrupted, that's felt by kids. School closures or school as a social environment, hugely critical. And it is a place where our children receive all different kinds of supports. Also, uh, if our parents are, are reacting to patterns and reacting to stressors, that is impact for kids. And also, uh, in terms of access to peers, friendship is highly critical at this developmental level. In May 2020, across the globe, we had 138 countries who had shut down completely of their school environments. So that estimate is that 80% of our school-aged children globally were out of school. That's a profound impact um, and uh, a great concern for all of us in mental health and addictions. We know school environments are places where kids get access to mental health resources and also social service networks. So those are critical environments. So the potential for impact in childhood. At adolescence, we know we are already dealing with the developmental stage where psychopathologies can start to develop due to biology and social uh, progression. And so that was a worry, you know, how is COVID going to impact on that? Also, our teenagers are very smart people. They also sense the stressors in our family environments around us as parents. Uh, also, we, they've lost the potential for loss of peers. And what we saw, I think, to happen was a strong pivot to social media as a place to get those needs met with all the positives and cons of that experience, right? And also uh, uncertainty, milestones being changed potentially at risk. Has anybody had anybody to, uh, graduate from high school in the last couple of years? I did. A whole different adventure under COVID. Um, young adulthood, you know, let's think about those people who had to cancel weddings, had to cancel that baptism. My grandparents weren't at this. It has a profound effect on those early adult years where big things are happening. And also uh, access to their social lives, critical in, the, in young adulthood. And many, we know there's a subpopulation in Canada of young adults who move back in with their family members, back in with parents. And then that has some adventures involved in that, um, but also potential for a stall in establishing themselves developmentally. And also a critical factor is long-term education and employment. So what is that gonna mean for our kids? My kid sits in front of a computer to do university right now. It's a whole different experience than I had uh, 30 years ago. Also middle adulthood, where many of us might, might be sitting right currently. Uh, we are that sandwich generation. So we're gonna be worrying about the economics of this whole effect. How do we keep our jobs? How do we pay, get, have that paycheck? We're also dealing with our child care and our, our school systems going down and also working. I became a grade four teacher in one day. 
it was an adventure while you're working, right? Um, and also, we are often the generation that's dealing with our elder folks in our communities. We're worrying about our parents at home or our parents in long-term care. So that was a, a risk factor. And of course, for our older folks, uh, you, I'll talk about a study in a few minutes. Loneliness is a factor in this. Mm -hmm. They're not accessing community supports in the same way, which can then lead to things like depression. And also safety issues. We know they're at higher physical risk. We also know there's particular uh, risks in our aggregated care environments, um, just by the nature of being together. So those are things that were predicted in the spring of 2020. And I think from the nods I'm getting, I think it speaks to most of our experience today. So what is this turning into in terms of the last two years in terms of research findings? So is, are those stressors actually showing up in some of the more longitudinal data that's coming out? And certainly I pulled uh, from 100 research abstracts uh, over three major databases some of the current research that is happening. And I can speak to some of these later if anyone has any questions. <clears throat> but what we are seeing coming out of the data is that adolescents are experiencing higher rates of anxiety, depression, stress, and higher utilization of alcohol and cannabis as a coping mechanism. We are also uh, seeing, even in the earliest years, this particular next study looked at uh, zero to six, even in the first early days of COVID, uh, this study, uh, a big study in Montreal across a number of early childhood education uh, groups uh, found already uh, issues with particularly male children and certain measures of functioning in early childhood environments. We also ha are now seeing coming out uh, most recently in The Lancet uh, discussions around the increase in incidence of eating disorder diagnosis in our communities, as well as the deterioration of patients who already have pre-existing diagnoses of eating disorders. For example, the U.S. is tracking data where they're seeing a higher rate of pediatric admissions around eating disorders in, in the last year or two. We're also seeing across a number of populations in the adult population, uh, large-scale studies that are being undertaken in Europe, as well as uh, the United States and Canada, uh, increased depressive and anxiety symptoms in our adult populations. Particularly vulnerable, we know from the research now, are those folks who had already pre-existing mental health and addictions disorders. Um, we, they are not doing as well in COVID, but maybe not surprisingly. And uh, our elder folks in community, the last study uh, uh, under the bullet there was a neat study out of England where they were tracking referrals to a mental, uh, geriatric mental health program and how their rates went up around lockdown and in the aftermath of uh, older folks showing up with loneliness, high rates of mood disorder, higher use of antidepressants, and lower uh, functional ability in their homes. So across the, the lifespan, the research seems to be telling us it is impactful at a national level. The next slide is talking a little bit more on Canadian data and little pieces of island data. Um, for, so uh, Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction, as well as the Mental Health Commission of Canada, has been doing a series of uh, polls since uh, the spring of 2020. It is showing that people with a history of mental health and substance use concerns previously are probably being disportion uh, disproportionately impacted by this event. Up to one in two individuals with an existing previous substance use disorder are reporting moderate, moderately severe to severe symptoms of depression since March 2020 in their data. Four to five in 10 out of 10 respondents with a history of substance use are also talking about increased consumption of substances. The Mental Health and Research uh, Canada group, in partnership with Health Canada, have also been doing national level stratified sampling polling. And they've uh, done 12 so far. Uh, PEI, being a smaller population, would have a little <coughs> less data contribution to that. Uh, about 80 islanders in each of the polls have been uh, surveyed. But in the 10th poll, uh, which covered de uh, the time around December 2021, uh, there was a special poll done in 200 islanders. And there's some data coming out of that now. One that I think is instructive is they asked 200 islanders, during the current COVID outbreak in Canada, please rate each of the following in terms of impact. And what we saw is that 60% acknowledged the possibility of a family member catching COVID was a great fear and concern. 57% of those 200 acknowledged the economic downturn or concerns. 50% acknowledged a family member losing their job as a major concern and stressor. 44, the possibility of losing your own job or pay or hours. 45, 
worrying about catching COVID, and 42, the challenges of your current job being impacted by COVID. So things like working from home, social distancing, and PPE usage would be under that. So definitely even within that 200 Islander sample, we're seeing some themes coming out of that. As I came into this role, I just came into it at the end of uh, February, I decided to put out a qualitative poll to 19 of our frontline uh, child and youth, so our pediatric network clinicians in our outpatient program, day treatment, residential day treatment, ER staff, and acute inpatient. And I asked them to feed back to me, what are you hearing from your patients around COVID and its impact in families? And you'll see some of the results there. I did a thematic analysis on that. We're seeing community and ER staff noting that reliance, increased reliance on cannabis and alcohol. So reflecting some of those national and international studies. They're seeing some students struggling with online education options, particularly those with learning disabilities, ADHD, et cetera. And real access issues or stress around access to internet or computer tech in our rural populations. They were also hearing concerns with families with zero to five year olds who currently have no access to vaccines and the stressors around that, keeping your kids out of play groups, dealing with daycare in that reality. And also real concerns about not having school as a critical place where we can keep a tabs on how kids are doing in terms of risk. Finally, the student wellbeing teams and the community-based outpatient programs also spoke about two subpopulations. Groups of kids who are feeling huge distress when schools were closed down with online education and less in so social contact, but also a small group of kids who also, who were previous to COVID, were already vulnerable in their relationship with school mm -hmm. and how that became more magnified during COVID. Finally, in terms of our community mental health statistics, so this is our community mental health network throughout the province. I'll kind of summarize it quickly. Overall, from pre-pandemic year 2019 to 20, into the most recent stats, 21-22, we're seeing our adult referrals uh, staying relatively uh, similar, uh, not huge changes. Also, our youth referrals have increased slightly, but where we are seeing some definite impact is in our walk-in clinics across the province. We're seeing an increase from pre-pandemic rates to current rates of about 12%. So for those of you who aren't familiar, these are clinics across the island where you can walk in during certain times and see a mental health provider quite quickly. You don't need appointment. And uh, they, they shifted to Zoom, but we're continuing to do face-to-face -face care during COVID. And so that tells us something. People were accessing those services. In terms, just quickly, of mental health and addictions, uh, research and education division, that's the one I've taken on in the last few months, happily taken on, I might add. Um, our, our mandate is to lead and participate in research and initiatives and projects, support our mental health clinicians to do research and apply research into their practice <coughs> on, across a number of areas, also to support our ongoing uh, e-mental health initiatives and assist in the evaluation and design of our current programs, but also the redevelopment. And on a daily basis, we have contact mm -hmm. about what is the science and how do we apply it. I have given you a handout on some of the current research projects we're doing, and I'm happy to speak to some of those. Our education, this is a very critical role, and it also speaks to your question, Ms. Beaton, on preparations to move, move units, etc. Education and onboarding of staff into new programs needs an education approach in order to be a best practice. And so that's a big part of what we do in my division. I have uh, uh, educators who do all of that work and they do things like trauma-informed care, what's the Mental Health Act and how does it apply, evidence-based psychotherapies, etc. And we're also assisting in our division um, in terms of sharing that evidence and research like I've done with you today. In fact, I'd like to just highlight a recent piece of research we've done. From mid-April to May 25th, our division was involved in a client experience survey that went out across the province to 16 inpatient sites as well as 12 community sites. And we tapped into the responses of 467 patients within our division. And we've just gotten the first uh, blush of data coming out of this and some interesting things we're finding. So we asked them a number of different questions. This was done via paper and pencil questionnaires, as well as we were piloting the use of iPad data, which was, that was a, something for me to get my head around. It was interesting. So one question we asked, are you more ready to do things I want to do because of treatment? 
92% of respondents said they are. They're feeling that impact of treatment. Were staff professional and helpful? 95% of respondents indicated they agreed or strongly agreed that is the case. Were people important in my life involved in my care? Again, 91% of respondents said they agreed or strongly agreed on that point. Were my cultural needs or preferences supported? 94% of respondents, again, agreed or strongly agreed. And probably maybe the most important, especially in PEI, did, did you feel welcomed in our services? And 95% of respondents indicate they are feeling welcome at this time. This would be a project that we have driven and overseen and delivered. And it's to the heart of what we do at Mental Health and Addictions, and that is that we serve Islanders in their need around uh, things happening like COVID, but also in the day-to-day -day health needs. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, Minister? Uh, yes, thank, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, before we get into uh, questions, I uh, certainly want to uh, thank Executive Director uh, Joanne Donahue and uh, Drs. Goodwin and Salabrina to uh, a big thank you from myself as Minister for the presentations that you have made here today. I think uh, it shows certainly the great work that, uh, that has been done, that continues to be done shows uh, as the example of the three uh, staff that we do have here today, but uh, to take that right down the line to the passion that our staff do have to provide a great service to Islanders. And uh, just uh, uh, before we do get into the questions, uh, Chair, I just want to make clear my appreciation to the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I will start questions off with Rob Henderson. Uh, thanks uh, for your presentation and that information. Uh, I guess that I'm going to start maybe first with, uh, with uh, Dr. Goodwin there, just on that survey. So I have to admit, I, I think anybody would have predicted those same outcomes of the potential impacts on mental health and Islanders, uh, psychology, all that stuff. So, so from that perspective, uh, it, it was a pretty good safe bet that that's what was going to happen. My question, I guess, to you is, did, was that information provided to the minister? Uh, or who, who, who got that information as far as what predictions might have been made? Which, which part? Because there were several parts. You mean, were, were we in conversation with our executive director, our psychiatrist? So uh, I can speak as a, as a frontline provider, and I don't know if this yeah. will add to your question, uh, Mr. Henderson. Um, immediately as soon as COVID hit, there was a massive pivot in our division. Um, yeah. We immediately were all on uh, multidisciplinary phone calls with our executive director, remember the days of the phone calls, uh, Joanne. And, and we were immediately, uh, literally team leads across the province tapped into that, as well as once we, we pivoted to Zoom Healthcare, feeding up the information and our expertise on these kinds of topics. So that would go up through our network. Uh, our psychiatry was represented on those calls, as was the senior management level, and then that would be briefed to the minister as those kinds of issues were happening. Um, it's a constant back and forth on the science mm -hmm. and the questions around science. Is that? Yeah, well, I guess like, that's what I'm coming from, is that obviously when decisions get made, and Prince Edward Island, we probably were the most locked down jurisdiction uh, in probably the world. <laughs> and uh, we, we would have, could have predicted from that that there would be these types of potential outcomes. When it comes to the issues around mental health and well-being of Islanders, and obviously, there's other decision makers that come into this, and it comes back to the health component, the acute health part of it. So I get all that. I guess from my perspective is, is that you've kind of had those predictions. You briefed the minister, uh, or at least somebody in, in your supervisor would eventually, yeah. I would assume, get that information to the minister. Uh, yeah. And so Just that was in the terms case. Of the communication. So the results um, came in. Friday. Well, on the, on the most recent survey, it yes. uh, came and in just last, last week. And so it's then um, what Jackie and her team do is they uh, looked Compile. at the results, prepared a briefing note. We shared that with uh, Corinne and Dr. Gardam and also our assistant deputy minister who takes it to the minister. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the process. That's all been shared. It was shared uh, Monday morning. So okay. So the minister then has been somewhat briefed to what the impacts of COVID on were going to be on mental health at various points in time, from the day one to. And obviously, as we get into three months in or four months in or whatever it might be. Uh, um, now, so minister, so from your perspective, were you convey 
conveying that message then to the decision makers, i.e., or I'm sure, sir, assuming you're one of the decision makers on this, but between you, uh, the Chief Public Health Office, and the Premier's Office, so there would be some discussions that you would be conveying to them that, you know, when we're going too far with the restrictions, it's going to have some negative impacts, and everybody's aware of that. Mm -hmm. So did you do that? Well, certainly, uh, the information that comes up, and as, uh, as you would know, uh, uh, MLA Henderson, uh, that there are briefing notes come to the minister on a regular basis on a wide variety of topics of uh, that information, dependent upon the flows up to uh, the ministerial level through either the deputy or the assistant deputy ministers. Uh, certainly dependent upon where it is coming from, what staff would be involved, uh, then uh, steps, uh, appropriate steps are taken. I think to your point though, uh, Rob, with regard to anticipating with uh, the survey that was carried out that, uh, that we would know in advance what the results would be. And uh, I'd have to go back to that word anticipate. Certainly you can anticipate it, but to make proper decisions for staff to, uh, uh, you know, carry on with existing programs, expand those programs, look at where the gaps may be. You not only have to anticipate what the results would be, but you have to have the survey and actually have the definite results of it. Rob? Uh, no, and I, I can appreciate that part of it. I mean, it, it, in governance, it is that we are trying to anticipate what the, the needs of Islanders would be in, in the decisions that we make. Uh, I guess from my perspective, I'm saying I think we could have anticipated uh, some of the outcomes that we're now seeing and being verified, and uh, yet we seem to go over, over the top when it comes to our uh, to maybe just the overall health side of the acute care side of the impacts of COVID. So, so what I'm trying to say is that was it a situation where we're starting to see that the cure on how we handle COVID is going to now be long lasting impacts on Islanders as we move forward. And it looks like the, the cure may have been far worse than what the illness might have been. And I think that's where I look at you as minister and the premier and the chief public health office. You have to collaborate and come together to try to decide what the best course of action to anticipate the long future that will be impacted here uh, to Islanders. So, so I guess I'm just saying, were you doing your part on representing the mental health side of the equation when it came to the Chief Public Health Office and the decisions that they were making? Well, I certainly, and uh, I uh, would welcome uh, uh, my guests here sure. with me, staff here with me, to uh, elaborate further on this. But I would have to say, and uh, we've heard uh, the Premier say it before, I've said it before, there's probably been no other jurisdiction that has relied more heavily on the expert advice, whether it's with regard to CPHO, whether it's with regard to mental health and addictions, whether it's with regard to uh, our acute care uh, service providers. But certainly, this is the first, as uh, every one of us in here realize, this is the first major pandemic, global pandemic, that we have dealt with, had to deal with, in over a 100-year period. There was no playbook for this, per se. So what did we do? And in my opinion, and uh, I'm sure in the Premier's opinion as well, is that we relied on the advice of the experts, continuously relied on the advice of the experts, and put programming, put uh, regulations in place uh, that, uh, that dealt and build upon the recommendations that did come forward from the experts. Joe, did you, did you want to add to that? Yeah, and just an example of that um, was the impact that our uh, mental health and addiction providers shared with um, the decision around um, alcohol and the closing of the liquor stores. It immediately pivoted based on the feedback that, our, that our, our doctors provided um, to the minister and, and CPHO. And so that, that is how responsive they were. And, and as, as you've said, there is no playbook, but 
one more, one more Rob. So I'll argue just, that there's no. Second. Oh. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. sorry I, I just want to add just a yeah. couple little pieces there. Um, I would be uncomfortable if this data is extrapolated today to go in to comment on uh, risk of, of closed down versus not closed down, et cetera. What this data that I'm presenting today, and it was the question put before us, is is there mental health impacts from COVID? Um, and, and the science is developing in that area. I, I would argue we don't yet have the data, or we would have to think about how to do the data on what would have happened if we hadn't done what we had done. I think we've seen jurisdictions across North America where there was not as robust a response, and they had the catastrophic numbers of deaths that we did not experience in this province in, in, in that level. And people dying is not good for mental health. It's not good for children, it's not good for parents, it's not good for families. So I would be uncomfortable extrapolating from, from this point. I think the other piece that maybe not everybody is aware of is that in those early days, and, and Joanne was part of this, as was Dr. Salaberia, we were pivoting very quickly. We developed programs to respond to the immediate need. And, uh, you know, so that was a whole back and forth going up and down the line in terms of designing those programs. I sat and helped run one of those emergency services. So there was a great deal of response hearing uh, based on consultation up and down the line. And, but the fact is, quite simply, COVID is stressful. It is enormously stressful for our healthcare providers as well as for our population. Thank you. Rob? So I guess I'd argue you're right that there's nobody's had to deal with a global pandemic. But on the same side, if there were 13 different playbooks that were put in place uh, by every other jurisdiction, they all come up with different choices. And uh, I guess I'm just trying to get a handle on how you how the choice got made to uh, deal with one component of it, which was the, trying to keep bilaters from dying, to the to the point where we're going to have long-lasting impacts where islanders are still dying, maybe not directly from COVID, but from mental health issues, suicides, uh, all the impacts, and, and also the the impact that it's had on the staff that you've had within your. Uh, you know, trying to deliver all these services. Uh, you're seeing now a mass exodus of a lot of your staff in various uh, uh, parts of uh, health care delivery in the province. So that comes into the equation too. I mean, I've got people that come up to me that uh, couldn't get their t cancer treatments done on time. You know, there, things were postponed. There's people have passed away for many other reasons, may not have been COVID related. So it's all, it, the way I look at it, it's about government trying to make the right decisions. And it seems like you, you didn't maybe weigh the, the components of mental health and addiction in the whole decisions that you made. So I just want to make that comment, and I'll have more questions later. Okay. Put your uh, yes. Michelle? I, I would like oh, sorry. To, Excuse to, me. to respond uh, to, to that in terms of um, the supports that we continue to put into place um, throughout this pandemic to support Islanders. And so we've trained staff up in, in eating disorders. We've seniors' mental health was rolled out. Um, the walk-ins um, were staffed permanently. We've implemented virtual care. Bridge the Gap and Strongest Families were funded. The mental health response was rolled out um, and is, is providing great support. Continued focus on, on our children's programs. We implemented the patient mental health uh, navigator. And um, just so, and that position goes a long way to help people find the source of sports they de they need and um, to respond to any stressor that they have in life, regardless if it's COVID or not. And uh, so it we're, we are building that base up for Islanders. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for being here. And um, I appreciate the COVID information that you've brought forward today because, yes, I think a lot of us could... Um, guess that that's the results that we were going to see. But my challenge is, is our challenges here on Prince Edward Island started way before COVID when it came to mental health and addictions. And I want to focus on that aspect. I will have questions about COVID shortly, but um, I want to focus on this is this was not created because of COVID. That was this was created because of a system that has grown into something that really isn't working for many. Right. And I understand everything that we're, you presented today was how you're going to shift to try to fix that, which I appreciate. Um, and a lot of it comes with new buildings, and you mentioned the programs that are going to go inside those buildings, which is important. I want to understand what we have done to review our current services that we're providing patients. So my understanding, and maybe you actually ask a question, 
how many hours of counseling do patients received, receive at Hillsborough Hospital a day or week when they are admitted to the hospital? How, how many hours of counseling per week do they receive? I guess I can answer that. I mean, I, th I think that just depends on, on, on what the individual requires. Um, again, whatever treatment plan is put in place is based on, on the needs of that individual, uh, specifically for whatever the issue is that they came in for. Um, so it, it really just does depend on what is needed and where they are. Um, there are some um, patients who are admitted to uh, the hospital, whether it's on Unit 9 or whether it is at Hillsborough, whether it's at Prince County, who are just not in a, in a state where they would actually benefit from counseling in a traditional sense. Um, and there are others that are admitted who certainly benefit from counseling and that is provided. So I think it really is hard to answer that question. It's a great, it's a great question, but it's, it's a difficult one to answer because it really just depends on the individual and where they are at that moment in time. And that shifts during the hospitalization. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so basically, whatever the need is, you know, we try to meet the individual where they are and provide the kind of uh, counseling or the kind of therapy uh, that would be most beneficial for them at that time. And just to add to that, this past um, week or week and a half now, we've uh, hired two new psychologists and um, they are working with our acute units across the province um, to standardize the programming along with our occupational therapists and as well as our residential uh, programs to meet clients where they are in terms of their readiness for counseling, but looking at um, understanding their illness, clinically understanding coping skills, DBT, mm -hmm. CBT, and, and Jack could certainly speak to mm -hmm. that in more detail, but that's, that's happening now as we speak. The program is already um, de designed, and, and they've designed that with us, and now it'll be rolling that out um, across all our acute care units. Okay. Michelle? Thank you, Chair. So my understanding was there was 1.5 FTEs for psychologists, which now through, they've left those positions, but has not been backfilled. So now we're gonna bring in these two psychologists. Will they actually be doing counseling, physical counseling with patients in the hospital? Yes. It's, yes. Okay. Yes. Michelle? So I wanna uh, just oh. touch oh. base on- uh, Sorry, I, I just need Michelle. to represent that because um, I'm a recruiter for psychologists, mm -hmm. so I'm pretty intimately aware of what they're mm -hmm. doing. So those two psychologists will have multiple roles. They will be involved in direct hands-on care with patients. They will also be acting as critical expertise for other care providers. So partnering, for example, with psychiatry around psychotherapies and approaches to care. Also with our nursing staff, uh, for example, around things like managing behavioral possible issues that may arise. Um, and they will also be contributing to design of current and uh, go forward programming and also with an eye to uh, what kinds of research questions may we have developed in these programs. And finally, both of those new psychologists uh, who have literally just arrived um, are, have also taken an interest in training new psychologists. So they're going to be uh, cooperating with UPEI's new PsyD program to bring in uh, PsyD students to help train them mm -hmm. and possibly to help recruit them. So I do need to say it's going to be a multifaceted role that those mm -hmm. psychologists are going to be playing. Okay. Michelle. Thank you. Um, because I've, obviously I've heard from families that they don't necessarily get access to counseling and they have been told that that's not available to them. And so when, um, as part of their the care team, you would think that the family would be a participant in, you know, advocating for care, which is why I've spoken to people. So I'm going to touch base on the policy and procedures manual for health PEI specific to private service providers in health PEI for managed facilities. And this is the document that really says that private service providers aren't part of the care of somebody who is um, somebody that's admitted into let's say Hillsborough Hospital, for instance. Um, and, you know, it's limited to space in which we know at Hillsborough Hospital there is no real rooms for 
private care um, practitioners to come in. If somebody has a relationship with a psychologist, it, they call it in the private private uh, system, are they allowed to participate in the care when somebody is admitted to Hillsborough Hospital? Because I'm hearing that they're not. From a policy perspective, I was asked that question, and, and perspective across health PEI is that they are, and if they're properly, have the proper insurance and, and that sort of thing. Um, I did not, was not aware that any, uh, that an individual ha was having space issues um, within Hillsborough Hospital, but um, I can follow up on that if you want to follow up after the fact, find out what the issue is. Can, can I just speak to that for a moment? Yes. Yeah. I have experience as an inpatient psychologist. Mm -hmm. I used to work at the Adolescent Inpatient Unit. That was my first job here. And I'm sure Dr. Salaberry can weigh in on this. Um, obviously, I can only speak to my own experience, mm -hmm. but when a, a new youth would come in to program, um, a big part of my job in that, I also have to underline social work because that is mm -hmm. our, our partners in care in those moments. We would be reaching out to those people who are important in that individual's life, that adolescent's life. So if I became aware that there was a provider in private practice who may have an important perspective on this youth, that would be part of my protocol that myself or, or social work frequently would be reaching out, of course, with patient permission, because that's what we have to do in healthcare, and, uh, and be gathering that data to better inform the treatment plan. The other part of that that we touch on is discharge planning. So when a youth, or I'm assuming an adult, Dr. Salaberia, goes out back out to community, uh, you know, you would be thinking about what's the care plan in our services if needed, but obviously if they've chosen to go with a private uh, person, um, you know, that might be a person I place a phone call to to say, listen, this is what we've learned, coordinate care, and so on. Um, so I can only speak to my own experience in my mm -hmm. practice and then that the teams I've been in, but that was not an unusual occurrence. And, and, and I'll just add one other thing. I mean, that being collaborative with any outpatient providers, whether in the private sector or public sector, um, that is part of uh, appropriate treatment and as part of um, what we do every day. Um, so certainly, you know, obtaining information and providing information, obviously, with appropriate consent. Um, is extremely important for, for the care. Having said that, um, the, when an individual is admitted to the hospital, they have, the, they have a treatment team in the hospital setting. Um, and um, that treatment team you know, has a treatment plan in place you know, that is being developed and morphing and changing as the hospitalization progresses. Um, so, you know, the individual is busy. I mean, they're, they're doing, they're, they're in treatment, they're, they're in the midst of an acute episode um, in treatment. Uh, and by definition, they were hospitalized because it required that. Um, so the services that were being provided as an outpatient from whomever it was, was insufficient at that point in time. So, you know, yes, collaboration and, and, and information sharing is, is crucial, but it's a very different thing to have that individual um, be a part of the treatment team if they are not part of the treatment team. So, it, so I'm, I'm a little confused in terms of exactly what you're asking, uh, but again, I, I think that we collaborate, we get information, we share information, and we appreciate and, and respect that information. Um, and it's very important uh, to have that information for, you know, to care for the patient appropriately. Um, um, but they have a treatment team in place already, wherever they are, whether it's Hillsboro, whether it's Unit 9, whether it's Prince County. And again, it always does come back right. to the consent of the, of the patient as well. Yeah. Uh, Michelle? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I guess who decides who's on the health care team of anybody who is admitted into the the acute care facility? The, the team, I mean, I guess the easiest answer to that question is just the team. I mean, you know, each unit has, you know, a, a cadre of individuals who work there, social workers, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, so that, that is the team. Um, you know, they, they are assigned to whatever unit they're assigned to. And, and 
patients are admitted and they're treated and patients are discharged and new ones come. So it's it's the team that's already in place. That's the decision. That's the decision that that's how the decision is made in the sense that where you're admitted, that that is the team that is in place. Great. Last uh, comment question here, and then we'll move on, Michelle. Yeah, and then I'll go back to the bottom of sure. this. Um, so in this um, policy, which is called Private Service Providers and Health PEI Managed Facilities, it talks about patient-centered care. This isn't a patient-centered care policy, though, if you read through it. So I, my first question was, is have we actually reviewed the existing policies in place to see if they actually align with the direction that you want to go? Because you can't have a community-based service if your policies aren't community-based or if your policies aren't, um, aren't patient-centered care. So um, given that, and I mean, Dr. Dr. Goodwin, you yourself know how important psychology is to somebody's treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I still would like to understand how it's determined how many hours a day or week a patient would receive. Because I've heard from people who have been in the facility who have gotten, not gotten accent, access to counseling. And I find it hard to understand how somebody in a mental, that is dealing with mental, Ill, mental health illness is not getting counseling. As we know, when we put them back out into the community, that's exactly what you're going to be putting them out into. So it would seem like that would be part of the plan while they're receiving the services in the acute care facility, especially if that's the world that they're coming from. So are you directing your question towards Hillsborough specific there, or? The, well, yes, because that's the example that I have where people have been told that they cannot have uh, um, counseling, especially with um, the uh, private service provider that they had been working with prior to going in. And, and uh, we're reviewing all of our policies, um, signing, like looking at all of the policies in that context, evidence-based care from best practices in other jurisdictions. Um, I'm not sure if that one um, has hit that high watermark in terms of review, but I know I've been signing policies that apply to all. Leslie, our director and, and our providers provide other uh, re sign off on policies. So I will look at that one. I will ask to have it reviewed uh, in that context. Okay. And I just will follow up on that. I get that. Um, but if it's going to be patient-centered care, who, like who reviews it has to be somebody who's, you know, in the family or patient yes, or something, especially are, when they've been uh, gone through treatment and deem that they can contribute, yeah, not just who's already written the Patient-centered care or individuals that look at it from a, a, a patient who's been in, and um, so they review the policies. But also, we look at best evidence across the country, look at best evidence um, from other jurisdictions who offer similar programs, and then we have multidisciplinary team of clinicians look at our policies. And um, once it's been vetted by all those that have a uh, stakeholders, then we, then we sign off. Can I just say one thing? Again, I'm, just a, I'm still a little confused. And, um, and if we're talking about providers who, have, who don't have privileges at the hospital, who are not you know, health PEI employees, who are not hospital employees, um, that complicates matters in terms of them providing care in the facility. I just want to put that out there. It is, it, you can't just walk in you know, and provide care in the facility. Uh, like I said before, collaboration, information, you know, professional, collegial, uh, back and forth, you know, really about the individual, absolutely. Um, but providing care in the hospital setting without having basically privileges is a whole different story. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate it. Uh, Carla? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for, for being with us today. I'm going to jump in here. I've got two clarification questions that I hope won't be counted to warm my questions. I hope they'll just be really quick answers. So you mentioned there was uh, earlier in your slides there were co-occurring com complex mental health programs that are going to treat mental health and addictions. Are they going to treat them concurrently? With, with each program that we stand up. Um, we have a multidisciplinary team and they look at a number, they start with the best evidence across the country. We rely heavily on Jackie's team to seek that out. And then we um, look at um, 
what does that look like? Then we process map um, exactly who would be making referrals to this program, what does a treatment day look like, a day in the life of, and, and then um, so how, when it is co-occurring or when it is not, that we're designing the facilities to allow for that. And so that's part of the uh, frontline clinicians who work in this program, in these programs every day, providing that advice and assistance. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to be, thank you, Chair. That's going to be quite a difference from how we do that mm -hmm. now. So I have a bunch of questions yes. about that later. Um, what do you mean when you say gender specific? So that's, uh, so for example, um, so, for example, our, late, our current residential program developed uh, specifically around uh, individuals that identify as women. Um, we know that there are uh, nuances around gender and issues that may interact and impact on substance use and abuse. And also in terms of factors of uh, what, what, what kinds of components do they need to to work on that uh, journey towards wellness, right? Um, and so there, it, it was a factor in our mental health uh, redevelopment internal consultations, recognizing, uh, for example, in that one particular program that we did need to increase numbers of beds and programs specifically around some of those issues for, for individuals who identify as women. So if I'm a trans man, I can access services through a men's program? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. How you identify? Um, well. Okay. Thank you. Those are my two clarification questions. So, I have a child, let's say, who is struggling with mental health. We are a family in crisis. I go to accessibility supports through social development and housing, and I cannot, even though accessibility supports now has grown to include mental health, I cannot get mental health therapy or counseling services for my child because they don't fall under that umbrella. And that was confirmed for me in a written question from the department because they say it falls under health. Um, I, that was a great presentation of what's happening in the future, but I wanna know right now because there's so many people, families suffering. I take my child to a mental health clinic. They can't be seen unless they're, I can't remember if it's 14 or 16, I think it's 16. Catholic Family Services Bureau has closed. I can no longer access music therapy for, or play therapy for my child. Um, there are very limited counseling services in the community. School counselors are swamped. Student well-being teams are swamped. Where do I take my child? There is walk-in clinics available. Not for children. 16 and above. Mm -hmm. yeah. But my child. Uh, oh, no. I'll, uh, yeah, Sorry. I'll go through Sorry. the chair. Thank you. Because yeah. uh, they're, they're in the booth there. So I, I love sure. they, So we'll just Thank give that chair. pause. Thank yeah. you. Uh, who, who's up? <laughs> <laughs> so my child is under, my child is seven years old. Where do I take them? Do you want me to speak to that? So, so part of that would, uh, I guess, depend on, so if you're a parent, and I'm a parent of a kid not much older than this, where could I get access? So if you're in absolute crisis, you can walk into our ERs with a young child, and our psychiatrists and staff in ERs deal with uh, children and adolescent cases daily. Um, uh, if you're, uh, you can walk into a student well-being. Uh, I, I do hear your point about they're busy. Of course, they're busy. Uh, they're, you know, that's the job in healthcare, right? Uh, you can walk into your school and ask for a referral to student well-being team uh, very quickly. That's that's part of our school environment around that model. The other place is you can place a phone call to our community mental health networks um, and uh, speak to the initial intake triage individual who will then work through a analysis of the particular kinds of issues that are presenting for you as a family. Um, and so then that would triage you out into a series of services. So for example, if it is a, a milder end of, uh, you're saying crisis, but our definition of crisis is different for everybody in those moments and there needs to be some analysis on what that is. It can be anything from an online uh, coaching model as in strongest families, to individual assessment, to individual treatment if it's felt based on the evidence that that's the best uh, move. It may be a group psychotherapy model, for example. There may be consultation out to our psychiatry group around if we feel medications are indicated there. 
then it attaches into the rest of our network. Um, so, for example, if uh, at some point, if, you're, if your child is an adolescent, um, you could wind up networking into my program that I run, the Insight program. We also obviously have a dedicated adolescent, uh, child and adolescent uh, inpatient unit that takes care of those kids who do present to ER uh, in some heightened crisis to require hospitalization. So those would be some of the steps that would be uh, also, possibly involved. Yeah, mobile mental health. Mobile so mental health. They, yep. they can send a unit to to the home to, if they're in that crisis as well. And and Carla? thank you, Chair. Um, and you know, I, to Michelle's point. I recognize that this is not anybody's fault. You know, 100%, I, I, it's nobody's fault. But this has been years and years of a system that never worked. It was always just kind of thrown together. And so I see this presentation of what the future might look like, and it's beautiful. But we've seen these so many times before. And it makes, it, it, it does, it makes me angry because, you know, and as one example is our children. Because I have got neighbors and friends and family members, close family members, who didn't have those options for their children. They went to the emergency room and they were sent home. They called child protection, no one could do anything. They called the police, the police couldn't do anything. So I wanna know, and this, I, I guess I'm just gonna throw this out there because I, I, I'm very conscious of time, there's a lot of questions, this is important. Um, I wanna know, you know, you've talked about um, investments in children's counseling. You've talked about walk-in clinics where children, um, I, I'm wondering when children, are children gonna fall under that mental health um, walk-in clinic umbrella with this new system? What, what does our investments in child mental health look like in this system? Because the one we have right now d isn't servicing our children. Well, we just, like I, I said, their investment in, in strongest families um, they provide an excellent service and it's virtual and it's after hours for parents um, for children but there's also a component that's available for families as well mm -hmm. and then also we have really robust uh, children's services with community mental health and a number of these other programs that that are available to them and client and we do need to triage um, uh, for for the, but we're also working with primary care in terms of collaborating with our primary care partners to um, for those family physicians, nurse practitioners, um, for the, the lower level anxiety to understand and to support them. But then when the complex cases um, of more complexity, they would be referred to mental health and addictions. Mm -hmm. Last one for Thank Carol. You, Thank you, Chair. And so, as a as a former school counselor, I'm well aware of, of those programs, and they are wonderful for a lot of families. And they're not; they don't work for other families. I, I know two people who have gone through pro, the, all of the programs once, and she asked, well, "I don't know what else to do," and they said, "Do them again." Um, and so, when you say that we triage, it scares me because I know these some of these kids personally, and they have not been. If, if we're triaging, they haven't been deemed you know, as an urgent need of care. So, I, gosh, I can only imagine what the children who are receiving care, what what sort of shape they're in, and that's that's really devastating. Um, but, but like in terms, like family doctors, if they, they're, we've been advising them of our referral process to strongest families, that they can support that immediately. Like yeah, and that's, Carla? thank you, Chair. That's marvelous if you have a family doctor, right? Yeah. Um, so you I guess. Require, uh, you don't require a referral. From the family doctor to access the strongest family, you call one phone number. Yes, yes. and you can get access to that program. Yeah, but and there are most of those programs. Source. Yes, yeah, that. No, you you're welcome to go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I I would also just like to point out, and um, as a person who's consulted to schools throughout my career, oh, my I actually worked for our school board at one point here in the province, and I've consulted widely in other provinces I've worked in. First of all, the work of our guidance counselors across the province are huge, and I have profound respect for that, uh, that occupation. Also, our teachers. Uh, also, the student well-being teams, um, like any new program, had to find its, its ground and, and move in there. Um, I receive referrals daily from that program for kids who are in high-risk, uh, severe moments like you're talking about. That punch the back over to me so that, to the right level of care, right? And so I, I, I do need to speak to those 
professionals because they're very highly committed and they are doing that kind of care. Also, approximately six years ago, uh, my program didn't exist. It exists now, and it was accredited yesterday. We have made huge investments in this province in terms of uh, child mental health. Uh, prior to this government, successive governments. We had the strength program increase the number of beds and the length of stay staying. My program was created. The behavioral support team was created. The initiative under Strongest Families was created. There were increased number of per, uh, permanent um, positions given to the inpatient unit because I worked on it at that point, so I'm very aware. And the student well-being teams were, were birthed. In one year, we had a reduction of almost 20% of adolescents showing up in our ER based on some of the birth of those programs. We had almost a 25% reduction of um, early, our younger kids showing up in our ERs uh, in the aftermath of things like behavioral support team who target those kids. So I, I just feel like we just need to, I absolutely am hearing you in terms of the crisis in schools across this country. Uh, mental health is actually something I'm very passionate about. But I think we do also need to balance that there's a lot of professionals across the province who are working really hard at that. Thank you for that discussion. On Thank you, Chair. I, I, I'll leave my last question, but I would just like a comment. I agree. If you look at the, on paper what we've got for our children, it looks really great. And, and those programs and those professionals working for our kids, we would be even in a more dire straits without yeah. them. So no, no discredit to, to anybody who's working with our children. But what I'm saying is, is that we need significant more investments and we need to understand if, you know, we talk about um, looking at things through a children's rights lens and through uh, a best interest of the child. And I would love for us to go through all of our policies, all of our health policies with that lens because our children are not being serviced in the way that they deserve to the extent that they deserve. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Zach? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all for coming in to present today. I really appreciate it. Um, my, my question, I just have a couple of questions. My first question, I guess, is uh, more for Dr. Goodwin. Uh, Dr. Goodwin, I think you were mentioned that you were part of recruitment for psychologists in the province. Is that correct? My, my question to you is, is basically, you know, how is that? Because, you know, we do hear in other uh, areas of the healthcare system that, you know, the recruitment can be a little bit tougher because, as you mentioned in your findings, that, you know, mental health is something that is, you know, increasing, I think, right across the country, if not right across the globe. Yes. So, you know, maybe just touch on how that recruitment process is going. In, uh, so, uh, recruitment is a multifaceted dance with highly um, trained individuals where there is fierce competition nationally. And that's not just psychologists currently, it's also MSWs, it's psychiatrists, it, it is quite a dance. Um, in the last three years, I'll speak more specifically to psychologists, it was identified that we, we need it more. We, uh, the skill set that psychologists can bring is that balance of both hands-on care as well as our science research training that goes into us. Um, and so an initiative was started within Mental Health and Addictions in partnership uh, with our Recruitment and Retention Secretariat under the department, as well as uh, the then uh, Assistant Deputy Minister and Minister were aware of this initiative. And we identified things in our HR uh, realities, as well as our Public Service Commission, that needed to be shifted to adapt to the recruitment of, of psychologists. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a big piece of work that's been going on, ongoing for three years. In the last three years, we have managed to recruit nine new psychologists into our system. Um, it, they are long recruitment journeys. Uh, so I started talking to one who's coming in September one year ago because they're not sure to work where they are, right? So it, you have to be able to talk to them about the level of practice here, about where we're going, where we're currently at, and also how their st skills can plug into our system for the best benefit. We also need to be able to talk to them about things like science and research in our practice because they are listening for that in recruitment. We also need to be able to set up uh, things around them, such as our Psychology Practice Council, which we set up about four years ago, where they can plug in and get their peer support. Um, so there's been a number of initiatives around this. We're now starting to work on our social work uh, file. Um, I'm not directly involved with this, but another director is. And uh, it's lots and lots of work, Mr. Bell, but it's darn exciting when you see them coming across the door. Zach? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, and thank you. That does sound exciting. So 
I, you know, kind of touching on what Michelle had mentioned as well, though, you know, like we hear from people that, you know, they're waiting, you know, sometimes six months, maybe even longer to see a psychologist. I guess, how is the department right now working at, you know, alleviating that, that wait list, I guess, or that wait to, to actually see the psychologist? I know you're recruiting strong, but yeah. I guess that's my question. I think, again, it's hard to do a blanket statement across because every program is different and every program has different wait times and every program has different models of care. So not every single program would have a psychologist embedded within it. Uh, it depends on the population, what kind of service you're delivering. Um, I think, too, what we're recognizing, in the, and my colleagues can chime in on this, is where we're really moving to in this province robustly, particularly in this redevelopment, is very strong multidisciplinary care. So it's not just asking for a psychologist or a psychiatrist, for example, although definitely there are cases that need those, but it's also maximizing the scope of practice around our MSWs, around our occupational therapists, around our nursing partners. Um, so we need to think about it as a team approach um, in addition to cases where there's individual need on certain kinds of expertise, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's that's part of it, definitely. Recruitment is, you need uh, bums in the chair to do your job bluntly, right? So we do have to recruit those people, but also set them up in the system so that they can maximize their skills in consultation. So I'm one psychologist in a program, but I help support nine other practitioners with my psychological knowledge, as would Dr. Salaberry and his teams where he practices. Zach? Thank you. Just two more questions. I'm going to actually switch over to uh, Dr. Salaberia. Um, just with regards where you're talking to the uh, partial hospital program, which will be up and running by September at the QH. Um, That's it, our anticipated. Anticipated, of course. Working hard. How do you bet? Sorry, yeah. Time. Um, so my question, is that going to be implemented? You mentioned, I think it was on slide five, about, you know, with Alberton is under construction, Summerside. Um, is that looked at in other parts of the province as well? Um, the, the quick answer to that is no, uh, because we are we are starting with the program here in Charlottetown. Interesting that you mentioned that, because the, the moment that I mentioned uh, this initiative uh, to my psychiatric, uh, psychiatrist colleagues, who, by the way, were all very excited about it, um, the very first uh, word out of one of my colleagues' mouth from the Summerside area was, can we have one here too? <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, I, you know, we have to start somewhere, and, and we're starting here um, in September um, in, in Charlottetown at Hillsboro. Um, I anticipate that it's going to be very successful and it's going to be very useful and, and beneficial to patients. And uh, certainly, I have no qualms about um, working with my colleagues who, mind you, do a lot of work um, to <laughs> actually. You know, build uh, another one in Summerside or wherever it needs to be. Um, and now, mind you, that is future future state, obviously. Um, but to answer your, your question, the quick answer is no. However, if there is a need, um, you know, I have no problem, um, you know, making sure that everyone knows that there's a need, and if we can make it happen, we can make you know, we'll make it happen. Zach? Uh, last question. Thank you, Chair. Um, and just on that, and I'm assuming that this has already been looked at, but uh, where you were talking about the uh, partial hospital program, it's, you know, people have their lives, it's community first. Uh, I'm assuming that, um, you know, if people are going to be traveling from outside of Charlottetown to this, that there will be, you know, looking after transportation. I know the province has done a, a big job in trying to push that rural transit. I don't know if that's something that would be incorporated into this as well. Um, I, th I think that's an excellent um, uh, yeah. comment. Um, certainly, as we develop the program, as we develop the program, um, certainly transportation needs to be part of that picture. Um, and it also goes to your first question, which is, you know, in the future, um, you know, could we have multiples uh, much closer to uh, individuals' communities? I would love to see that. Um, I think that, um, you know, treatment um, in the community is really the way to go. And we, we, the universal we here in the province, I think really, you know, um, need to invest in that, and we are investing in that. Um, and I think we need to continue with that because um, it's it's a long drive from Tignish to Charlottetown. And at the same time, the plan that was endorsed by all parties, partial hospitalization, was in Charlottetown, um, and so it would require um, additional mm -hmm. funding oh, and, and the whole processes that go along with that, right? So. 
we are trying to move and pivot to the to the plan and um, but as things change and as needs in the community are identified we'll certainly bring those forward yeah, yeah the, the partial hospital program it's 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 a task I mean there are a lot of staff there's a lot involved in getting that standing um, and, that, and that's what we're doing now for the first one, for, for, for the one, <laughs> and hopefully there'll be more than one in the future, but that's in the future. That's good, thank you. So I just want to check in, uh, thank you for our guests. I mean, uh, we, you, you're not, we, we have 25 minutes left of questions. Um, we can, uh, you, you can take a mental health break. It's got to be very <laughs> quick. It's That'd like maybe lovely. a minute, <laughs> one at a time or so. We'll keep going, but if you, if you feel the need, like, uh, just, just, just want to check in with everybody. So, 25 minutes left for the committee. Um, we're starting on a, a second round of questions. So, uh, Rob Henderson. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, just to get some clarity here, it's great to hear about positions that you fill. But I've, I've asked that question before, and there's always the underlying theme: how many external vacancies, or just vacancies in any capacity, are in the mental health and uh, uh, addictions division, like the healthcare casualties? Can be any kind of number, like in say psychiatry, psychology. RNs, uh, that kind of thing, because I, I think that gives context on whether you can deliver all the services that you intend to do. It's great to have the buildings and the, the concepts, but you have, it's, in the end of the day, it's boots on the ground, people who have to do the counseling, who have to talk to the patients uh, virtually or otherwise. So maybe give me a sense of what that number looks like. Um, I should have checked the number before oh. I came the exact <laughs> number, but I, I will maybe tell you that um, the community first, uh, or, oh, sorry. No, you go in. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, the community first philosophy um, has certainly caused, you know, has caused a drain on, on our queue because people have 12 rather day shifts and, and rather than 24 hour shifts and, and all of that. So, and, and we, uh, we certainly are looking at that and the challenges that come associated with it. But um, yeah, so we, we do have vacancies. We're working extremely hard with our recruitment and retention and um, all of our areas to recruit to those positions and because we know that then we can stand up all the, the, the programs that we need and um, so as with Lacey that got stood up and now we're working on um, structured and staffing to that effect and, and so that we can continue to provide the seats services to Islanders um, in these treatment spaces. So. So, I, I can speak to psychology uh -huh. um, specifically because I carry these numbers around in my head all the time. <laughs> um, the uh, as of right now, um, three years ago we had we had multiple positions <laughs> open, um, and so with the influx of nine new psychologists, we have filled every position that is funded, which is a critical issue, except for one right now. So I'm literally in a very odd moment of going. What's our next set of things? Because uh, we're having great, greatly increased success, although that comes from tons of hard work. So right now, and that one role that has not been filled yet is our newest clinic, our Occupational Stress Injury Clinic, uh, which is targeting uh, specialized services for uh, RCMP, former military, et cetera. So that, that ad has just been up in the last six to eight months. So that's a brand new ad. Um, so right now, we're under uh, conversations about in the next rollouts around our, our redevelopment, what is going to be our psychology needs, as well as other kinds of professions. We're, un we're undertaking analysis on that now, and then out of that comes uh, jobs, job ads. So when, you say, so when you say funded, so that's just funded. what you have now. So for this new plan that you have, you're going to have yay many more positions. Is that what you're saying? And they're not funded just yet? They're going to be funded? Just to clarify. Uh, some of them we brought forward sooner uh, um, because of the need. So um, some positions we were able to bring forward sooner. Um, so we there was an analysis done about the projected uh, uh, needs across when all of these programs um, were stood up, but because we're moving ex ex instead of waiting on the partial hospitalization program, um, we'll be able to. Some of those positions were brought forward on, and we'll be use, applying those to the partial mm -hmm. hospitalization program. So, so currently, we only have one vacancy in psychology. What about all those other professions uh, within mental health and addictions? Is there any amount of vacancies there? I mean, if one doesn't sound like very much. So it sounds like you shouldn't have any problems from a staffing perspective. No, we we, we no we have challenges. Oh. <laughs> well then, yeah. well, give me a number. Uh, uh, just said, Minister uh, 
Hudson. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And certainly uh, a very uh, relevant question, Rob. Uh, what I would suggest is uh, be more than happy to go back and uh, just to make sure that I'm completely clear. What you are asking here is vacancies at any level with regard to mental health and addictions, and what we can do is go back, provide that information back to uh, uh, the committee uh, through the clerk and endeavor to have that back to you as soon as possible. I think uh, with uh, regard to psychologists, and it is not for you, it's a challenge without a doubt. Right across uh, the country, uh, we see uh, the implications of uh, lack uh, or challenges in recruitment. And the reason that we do have challenges in recruitment is because we don't have the bodies there collectively right across the country, right across North America, probably globally, to fill the number of positions that are vacant. But it does show, uh, and to use the example of a psychologist, uh, the fact that the great work that is done and continues to be done in recruitment it shows the values of having, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, incentives to provide to uh, professionals when they do come into those positions. And uh, just with regard to psychologists, uh, and Dr. Goodwin, certainly correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, a year and a half, two years ago, there was no incentive for psychologists. There was a $15,000 one that was put in place, which in conjunction with the great work that is done by recruitment, but I feel quite confident it also had, uh, had a very positive impact as well. Rob? Yeah, no, I appreciate that, but I guess where I'm trying to come from is that you, so you get all these plans, and, but then you're telling me that there's all kinds of limitations in being able to recruit and retain staff to these positions to be able to deliver the services that you're trying to accomplish. And, and like I say, it's great to have the plans, but if the people aren't there, so I think it has to come into the reality of the decision making you make on what it, you're realistically going to be able to deliver. So, so I guess I want to get a sense of the retention side of things. So are there a lot of people exiting the system within the mental health and addiction sector, uh, within health PEI? Uh, is like morale at an all-time high, all-time low? Or I mean, I'm, I'm getting comments that are kind of on the negative side, but I'm curious to what your take on it would be for the staff that are probably watching, you know, everybody's happy and things are going smoothly, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> with with uh, recruitment, I will say that um, the whole emphasis that we're doing in terms of the, this, this government and all parties have contributed to, in terms of the campus model, in terms of the redevelopment from master planning on mental health and addictions, has been a huge recruitment tool to bring client uh, to bring providers here they they are excited about what we're doing them they they totally support the whole community first model and understand and, and and reflect on that when when they make their decisions to come at the same time um, as, as you've said, re with retention, we, we are fortunate that mental health clinicians, um, we do, and I don't have the exact number on retention right now, but um, but we, we probably can provide it, but we do have staff that have served for many years in mental health and addictions, and it is their, their, their place where they feel that they are contributing to Islanders. And at the same time, change is hard, and, and this there is a, a when we're making changes in mental health and addictions, we are working with the unions, working with um, the frontline staff, down on the floor, talking to the staff. What what supports do you need? Uh, well, we need. One, we'd like to talk to HR. Okay, we'll have HR come down this Friday and, and meet your individual needs so that you understand what does this mean for you in terms of change. So um, that's and EAP we, uh, career. We a lady asked if she could have some support in terms of writing a resume. So we're lining that up for her this week. So we try 
to do what we can in terms of supporting staff. Um, the the security is is um, a strong component of what staff need to feel, uh, and so we have strong uh, staff in our um, Hillsborough Hospital, strong security staff that that respond when they're needed. So. Um, yeah, so we're doing a staff satisfaction, staff engagement survey, and so we will use those results to look deep into our services and how do we support staff in doing the great work that they do. It is not easy work, and, and I, that is not lost on me every day. And so how, what do they need um, to, to do their best work every day? Um, because it's very draining, and yeah. Last one, Rob. Thanks. Yeah. So you mentioned security. So what was maybe you could elaborate a little more on that. So is there like security should be an easy thing to, the, from a training perspective to have people that would be able to handle security at the facility. So maybe you could elaborate what the yeah, issue we, there we is. Yeah, we involve our security team on our advanced code white training or not, uh, and any other training so that they're trained and aligned with our staff. And whenever they they call, they come and they respond very quickly to any situation that is presenting itself. And they're well known in our facility and well trusted. Uh, and um, so yeah, so we work. We the, all our staff are trained in a number of modules around nonviolence, crisis intervention, uh, advanced code white, um, some other behavioral. Uh, gentle persuasion gentle techniques. persuasion yeah. techniques um, but for advanced code white um, the <clears throat> our, our security staff are all trained in that aspect of it but then we train with our staff um, so that they get to know our staff but the, the staff get to know them as well so that they're part of the team in that in that regard I, I and I want to just underline that the vast majority of our patients would never be in a code white situation um, it's you know that's that's a it is a reality in healthcare, not just in mental health care, that there are moments of high dysregulation, and we need to have uh, procedures in place to both protect patients as well as staff. And so, some of the ones that Joanne's already talked about would be the gold standard in that area. Um, but the vast majority of our mental health and, and addiction patients are not violent. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, there's so many places to go, so little time. Um, so high staffing turnover, I might as well ask the next next question on that. So I was told that there was, in the last year, uh, a significant turnover at the addiction center, at the um, Mount Herbert Provincial uh, Treatment Facility, um, an exodus that you haven't seen in the last 20 years. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you're tracking high turnover units, facilities, um, departments, and how are you measuring what issues those frontline healthcare workers are experiencing and why they're leaving? Yeah, and so I, I mentioned the staff engagement survey, and we'll be looking at that. Um, we HR does some exit interviews with staff if they leave um, as well, but as well. We have seen turnover because we have created opportunities in the community. And so when you don't have to work 24-7 um, shift work, you are going to look for those opportunities. Just These are some of the contributing factors of why there is some turnover. And as well as we've had turnover, we've had new recruits. And so for a period over the winter, we were reduced in beds. But I looked this morning, and, um, and so I'm monitoring that. We are at 15 beds there today, and our wait list has reduced dramatically, I think. Um, I did pull that one. Eight, I think it's eight males and four females on our wait list, which is down dramatically. So, um, but it has been challenging when when we had sometimes in a in a site that is not connected to a larger site, um, you are heavily reliant. You can't pull from from other parts of the building like you can in a in a larger site like your Hillsborough Hospital or Queen Elizabeth, right? And so then you are. Um, you, when, if a staff member does um, take another position, then it, it can impact. So we've been working very hard with them. Um, we've uh, written some float positions to cover maternity leaves. So we've had a number of maternity leaves. That was another reason was turnover. And so now we're looking to secure those as uh, permanent positions within Health PEI. So that when, or even mental health and addictions, three positions. So if we do have a maternity leave, um, it's really hard to recruit to a temp 
because of the shortage of nurses. And so we are making these permanent positions, but then they will cover maternity leave. And then if once that maternity leave is, is over, then they're given another opportunity in another part of the, the uh, could be Hillsborough, could be um, in a different part of the facility and community, depending on where the greatest need is. So. Michelle? And, and Chair, I'm just going to just say the Garth Waite report had a significant number of recommendations, especially around mental health and addictions departments and, and facilities. Can we get, ask that an action plan for those recommendations be sent to the committee so that we can review how you're going to implement all those recommendations and what the status is currently? Can we ask for that documentation? Sure. Well, the clerks just noted it, so we will yeah. keep keep moving along. Anyway. Exactly. I don't yeah, want to perfect. use that Excellent. time. Thank you. Um, the last minister. So um, that brings me to Hillsborough Hospital. So a memo went out to all staff at Hillsborough Hospital saying that they will not get vacation um, this summer. So you think about what all of those healthcare providers have experienced over the last two years, and then some because it goes well before that. No vacation this summer. Um, and how do we anticipate that we're going to re that we're going to retain people if we can't even give them their own mental health break? Um, the reason um, we could not give the reason that memo went out was to be in compliance with the um, the collective agreement, and and so that was that if we didn't notify staff, they wouldn't that they weren't getting vacation within a time frame, they wouldn't be able to carry it over. So now they have the right and with under the collective agreement to. Um, to carry over their vacation. But so that was why that action was taken to protect that the staff's vacation. So we were able to offer vacation last year and we are working um, and I think we have all vacation covered with the exception of and they're still working on it. And we have committed to staff that we will continue to work on it. But there's an LPN and um, one other one that we're working through. So we are working very hard because I know how staff have worked so hard through COVID mm -hmm. and um, they need that break mentally and physically to step away. And so we are working very hard with them and their unions and um, to, to achieve that. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm jumping around because I know that we're really short in yeah. time. And we did chair actually say at the last meeting that we wouldn't have a hard stop. That was a commitment that we had made. So I and understand we're we'll, working we'll, to we'll the go time. To five, we'll go to five after or ten after maybe. Um, okay. Yeah. It's just a lot of information to cover, chair, yeah, which is why I commit. You do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm so. sorry. Um, it is during the middle of accreditation, but. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> I, question. You can stay. Okay, yeah. That's okay. Right. Question. <laughs> yeah. These um, two can stay. Oh, good. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, so far. Chair? Michelle? This ID internship. So we are all of our students right now, that new four-year program at the university, all those students three years ago were promised that there would be an internship program as part of this ID program. They are now finishing their third year and there is no internship program. Why is there no internship program? We have one of those six students staying on the island trying to sew together and knit together an internship. The other five have gone out of file, and why did we allow that to happen? Um, so I, just a point of clarification, they were never promised an internship right off the top. Uh, I, I don't know what the communication is at UPEI. Uh, I sat on uh, in the Psychology Council where that discussion was happened. We were very clear we could not support a psychology inter residency internship um, at this moment because of uh, numbers of staff. Um, I've trained in other residency programs in Canada, and it is a huge undertaking to bring in uh, residents, at, like a full year internship training, because their national standards and a national body are accountable to around that. And they have things like staffing ratios, uh, particulars around the programming, et cetera. So I can, uh, I'm not sure what was said at EPEI, but I can be very clear because I helped write the documents around that, that we never committed to a residency because we're very mm -hmm. aware of what that is. We, however, have uh, recently deeply committed to practica, which is uh, most psychologists are trained in thousands of hours of shorter term training. It's attached into their coursework. And we've had conversation going back and forth with the PsyD program. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, right now, there is a PsyD program being trained in one of our programs. There are two more coming on board. Uh, end of summer into fall. 
So that's just a recent initiative. Um, we also need to be clear that the PsyD program is not a health PEI program. Mm -hmm. It is a university-based program. They have also developed their own internal training clinic where many of their students are doing their first rounds of training. We also have to recognize that we are just now, because that program is quite new, uh, Michelle, it's, it, they're just getting to the stage of being able to do residency and external practica mm -hmm. in their expertise levels. You can't accept a beginner into certain things. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I anticipate our training around this, because it will fall under my division, is going to increase over the next few years. I have to move on to... Um, One point on that. Okay. If we allow, though, people to leave the province to do their internships or residencies and that kind of thing, it is proven that they often don't come back. So that is a huge missed opportunity, especially when we're looking at a new medical school or anything like that, like to have people actually do residency in the province that oh, we want to make we want to retain them too is important. Just, just a point of clarification on that, they also return to where they do practica. Because I know mm -hmm. the stats now. But it's paid Great. versus not paid, though, right? Is a difference there? Uh, it depends on the site. Thank you. Thank you. Ola, uh, a couple quick ones. Uh, thank you. Oh, well, quick, I can make them. Anyway, they yeah, relate quickly. to, se unlike my uh, college, they relate to seniors. I'm a senior myself, and uh, I just read in the paper yesterday I lost my doctor. But um, anyway, I will be doing fine. My concern are the seniors living in uh, seniors' homes. And they come in two categories, and I, I wonder if you can answer the question relating to your, uh, you started out your statement with that you are providing equal opportunity for all. Um, there's two troublesome uh, populations in the seniors home. One is, uh, or are people that are what you would call mental, but you know, they're not treated, not looked after, they just roam the hallways and to scare the whatever out of the other residents and makes it even dangerous for them to be there. How are you looking after them? Because, you know, it isn't just that they could probably call if they uh, called the telephone number, but that's somehow not enough. It's like almost there should be somebody there looking after them. But then the other group um, are quiet people that may be sinking away into depression, unable to access any of your services. I can't access, for instance, your... You need a question? Yep. My question relates to the equal opportunities, or um, I, for instance, can't access your telephone service because my hearing isn't good enough. Yeah. But there's people like that. They are unable to... Uh, do the computer thing, maybe they don't even have a computer. How, how do you look after them? How can you offer them equal opportunities? It's a good question. When they don't have that. Doctor? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, I'm actually a geriatric psychiatrist by training. That's actually mm. my specialty. Mm. Um, so you're, you're discussing or you're asking in particular here on the island in terms of uh, long-term care and community care and facilities, I, I presume. Um, we do have the Seniors Mental Health Resource Team, um, uh, which um, is uh, in, in the Charlottetown area, it's based out of McGill, in Summerside it's, uh, it's based out of the Community Mental Health, and um, we have an entire group of, um, of professionals, uh, multidisciplinary, who physically go into nursing homes and community cares, and communities for that matter, and they're not all um, in those facilities, um, and provide uh, direct care either there or at the office. And I am the psychiatrist in the um, um, Queens and Kings County, um, and Dr. Uh, Tanya Gallant is a psychiatrist in uh, Prince County. Um, so we do provide uh, services to uh, the senior population uh, wherever they are. I personally do home visits, and I personally go to nursing homes and community cares, as do my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, My question actually was not related to the community care or nursing homes, but the seniors' homes where basically, uh, the, you know, people like, like barely know like people. Like apartment buildings? Apartment buildings. Yes, I, again, I run a clinic, um, you know, um, at, at McGill, and um, I, th these are out, those are, uh, those would be individual outpatients, you know, who are, are more than welcome to come to the, uh, to the clinic, or as I said, I do home visits as well as do my colleagues. So um, the, the, the services are available, um, and um, you know, the, the door is open uh, for those services. Car uh, Carla? 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to go in two different directions here. Uh, when I had mentioned earlier about how we were moving in this new direction, what a change that would be, I noticed your head's nodding. So I know that, that we have agreement there. So in order to do that, we need staff buy-in, we need staff to be trained, we need staff to understand the philosophies, because that's a, that's a massive shift. Having yes. worked at the addiction facility, that's huge, which it's fantastic. Um, it's what we should be doing. But I'm wondering three, about three different forms of tra training that, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more, but the three that pop into my head would be trauma-informed, harm reduction, and de-escalation. So I'm wondering, I've got two questions, but this is my first one, I'm wondering, how, where will these programs come from? Are these something the province will develop? Is there something, there are programs already that you're going to use? And if it is something the programs or the province is developing, how will we evaluate that? Because I would hate to see us reinvent the wheel for amazing programs, that, training programs that already exist. Well, I can speak to some of that, I guess, uh, because education, again, falls under my, my department. So currently, we already have a, a nonviolent crisis inter intervention, and that's uh, considered basic training for all staff coming in who are frontline clinicians and it's based on a national uh, program um, and that's actively being taught currently by my nurse educators. Uh, we also have a program, uh, it's, it's called Gentle Persuasion, that's, that's again about uh, you know, intervening at an appropriate level um, and trying to uh, offset moments of higher behavioral dysregulation. That's being actively treated or, or actively taught in our division currently. Um, so I'm sorry, I missed your third one. Was uh, uh, trauma and trauma informed harm care. reduction? And yeah, DSS. sorry. So trauma informed care. We have a whole component of training on that. I've actually sat that training myself, um, and it is part of our training calendar that staff can sign up for and get access to that. It is also one of the recommended basic treatments, or sorry, trainings that new staff are being put through. I have a new staff starting with me on Monday, and they are already registered for that. So we know as managers now. We're doing a lot of work on our training calendar, and credit to my education professionals on that. There are over 50 offerings of evidence-based training that can be tapped into around different topics. But definitely, non-violent -cri non crisis intervention is a huge, a huge issue. The creditors from across the country are here in the province right now, and um, they identified that one of our greatest strengths is actually our training calendar. Mm -hmm. And um, so it is, is really robust, such a great strength. It's easy to sign up. We in, invite staff who we orientate to it when they do the orientation to our, our programs. We cover you know the master planning and all of that in the orientation and then walk them through how to sign up for training. Really, uh, for us in mental health and addictions, it's the knowledge in the brains that provide the really good services for our clients. And so investing, we're not, we don't have the fancy t CT scans, but we have strong, strong clinicians. And investing in them and in their education and in their training is so important to us. Um, just, just wrapping up, I just have a cu couple quick questions and then I have... Uh, I I reached out to a community leader that's been doing a lot in mental health, so I just want to read her two questions off. I wasn't going to read them individually. I'll read them off both because yeah. I think the community has a, the people, the advocates have a, should have a chance to uh, ask questions directly too. So her questions are, people who were on a wait list were told they would be followed up with the community, uh, community mental health slash Richmond Center while they wait for a bed. This has stopped. Why? And uh, the second question was, government was receptive to having a committee of community members in recovery meet with them on a regular basis as they are on the front lines with people and can communicate any concerns. This doesn't seem to be happening. Why? It, it's not my understanding that the community wait list has stopped in terms of follow-up. I know that um, when a, a patient receives uh, care, after an acute episode, they're followed up within five days of an acute episode uh, and then linked um, with their community provider. Um, I will look into that on the wait list. I, it's not my understanding that that stopped. Um, and the second question? Um, the second question was uh, government, or maybe the minister can answer that too, uh, was receptive of having a committee of community members um, that were in recovery or that have recovered to to consult and to, to discuss with that have been through the programs? Um, uh, it doesn't seem to appear to be we, happening. 
Yeah, so in my previous role, um, we just hired a, a lady, Rebecca Jessamine, and she has reached out um, to all of our community partners looking for people with people with lived experience mm -hmm. to set up that committee. Okay. And um, so she, we are actively recruiting um, those individuals kind of as we speak. Um, we hope to get good representation, and so we will be involving those individuals on program design uh, of, of our facilities, but also on our policies. We want to involve them in um, just on our quality improvement committee uh, to, that's so that they can give us their perspective and we can hear from them about what is working and what could be improved. And so we've reached out to our community partners for potential names. And so um, she's gathering those names as we speak to, to set up this uh, group with people with lived experience, yeah. Can I just add a couple things Absolutely. to that? So uh, on some of the research uh, projects that are listed, uh, there is a number of projects over the last couple of years that are tapping into lived experience, meaning folks who've had experience with mental health and addictions, um, and trying to gain their perspective on their treatment journey and bringing that in. In fact, right now I'm trying to start to, to spearhead one getting developed for adolescents um, in, in the province, so that's another mechanism. The other piece is uh, that our Community um, community partners are now uh, partnering with Canadian Mental Health Association to bring in a new service called Peer Support Workers. Um, and th these are folks with lived experience who've received specialized training through our Canadian Mental Health and Addictions Partner. And we're now in the process of orienting them to our Mental Health and Addictions Service. I did a two hour uh, teaching session with uh, four of them two weeks ago um, that will also bring in that important lived experience uh, factor. Okay. Um, so we're, we're uh, thank you very much for your answers. Amazing topic. We need, the Islanders need to hear this and they need, need to do this right now. And I'm hearing from the committee uh, that, uh, oh, well, it's kind of like in sign language that 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 we I was seeing that, that we, yeah. we would. You guys are highly skilled. At that. Uh, not really, because I think I'll mess, I'll mess it up. Um, but maybe the the committee. I'll, I'll give the committee members ten seconds right now each to to talk about their concerns before our guests leave. Uh, that's all I can do. Yeah, Michelle. So I feel like we have huge blocks of areas that we haven't even covered yet. We haven't talked about vulnerable people. We haven't talked about, you know, services at the outreach center. We haven't talked about so many different areas, discharge plans. And I would ask, put out to the, um, to the committee that we knew we were going to run into this issue by trying to put these two huge topics yeah. into the same day. And I really am disappointed that we did it because I don't think we're doing you a service. I <laughs> and I don't think we're going to do the next group a service, like a, a good service, I would ask that we can have them come back so that we can feel like we fully cover the topic. Great. Is there any other committee members who would like to speak at this time? I agree. You agree? Okay. So that's we have it. So then we obviously we have committee business. For at this time, I want to thank our guests. This is a kind of very... Uh, so we, Zach? We need to discuss that in number six, though, right, of the agenda, in the discussion and schedule? Yes. Like yeah, that's one. Yeah. 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 Minister? Uh, thank you, Chair. And just to wrap up, I uh, certainly once again want to thank uh, staff that have appeared here uh, with me before uh, committee today. Uh, it's obvious, uh, quite obvious, uh, the knowledge, the background, and probably as importantly as anything, the passion that they do collectively have to provide uh, mental health and addiction services uh, to Islanders. I uh, also want to thank the committee members. I think that uh, uh, the questions were very relevant, great questions. And sometimes you'll get these questions that will uh, uh, spur the mind to things that we should be looking at going forward. Uh, Chair, I have to give you uh, accolades, credit. No, for reaching out to the community. I think it's great that you brought a couple of questions that you actually reached out to community to be able to bring them forward. Uh, Zach, uh, I know that you have uh, a passion for Western PEI and in particular Northport, <laughs> but uh, with that, uh, again, uh, for bringing up uh, the partial hospitalization program and the potential of rolling it out across the province. Uh, uh, being uh, here today with uh, my colleague from the other Western uh, districts, uh, 
yeah, I think it's it's a great idea, and it's something that warrants being looked into further. So, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guests. Appreciate it. What we'll do is it was going to be a 10-minute break. Now it's 5. We'll see you back in 5-minute members. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's right.
Um, we're back uh, for number number four on our um, agenda today, and um, I'd like to welcome again uh, Minister Hudson back um, with the. Uh, uh, a, a team of employees here from the Department of Health and and Health PEI. So, well, no, nobody's here from Health PEI, I guess. No. Oh, oh yes, 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 Health PEI. Great. So, what I'll do is I'll pass it over to our guests to uh, to I'll pass it over to the minister to to do opening comments, maybe introduce the introduce the guests one in time for Hansard, and then you're on your way for the presentation. A couple clarification questions, if need be, at the beginning, and then uh, or as we get going, and then we'll save questions for the end. It's all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and I'll keep my opening remarks very brief because I know that we're already running behind uh, time here a bit. Uh, first of all, I certainly want to thank uh, the staff uh, for attending with uh, me here this afternoon, and also uh, Chair uh, Michelle Dorsey of uh, uh, the Review Panel for Long-Term Care. Uh, with that, uh, I know that you're a big basketball fan, uh, Chair, so we'll immediately move into the second half. Well, <laughs> let's go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great. So I'm Deborah Bradley, Assistant Deputy Minister of the Department of Health and Wellness for um, Community uh, Health and Policy. And we have, um, we're going to talk this afternoon uh, a little bit of an update uh, around COVID-19, the reviews um, that have taken place and are underway, access to long-term care, and then um, efforts to support uh, long-term care. So I'm going to hop around the slides. It's not advancing for me. Just supposed to hit enter. Arrows up and down. It's not doing anything either. So Our te uh, now, the rest okay. No. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> run the clock Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Oh, okay. See it. I'm going to hop around just a little bit. We changed the order. Um, so um, as we look at um, outbreak data for long-term care, I think it's important for us to remember that in 2020, there were no outbreaks and no one died in long-term care, as uh, we saw in other jurisdictions in earlier waves. So during this period, um, the health system, both the public and private system, followed CPHO's public health measures to minimize any potential impact to residents and staff. By the time Omicron hit um, this past winter, uh, we continued to have a good supply of of PPE. Um, the sector uh, had ongoing infection prevention and control guidance and on the ground support. Um, residents and staff had been vaccinated and boosted, um, and by that time, Paxlova was available for treatment. So these measures combined had a protective effect and minimized um, the degree of morbidity and mortality on PEI. However, with that said, um, in PEI and long-term care sector, we had 23 outbreaks, uh, a mix between the public and private sector, and 26 of our residents were hospitalized, and there were 25 uh, deaths. And so I'm going to move back one slide and hand it over to Kelly Rayner. Kelly is our Director of Community Health within the Department of Health and Wellness. Kelly? Deborah, I just am going to provide an update on the inspection. So, uh, as we know, over the last six months, we've seen uh, a significant impact on COVID. And so, our board had asked for uh, all homes in in the private community care and nursing homes to provide uh, staffing summaries when they were in outbreak so that it could be monitored and the inspectors have been following up in those situations reviewing uh, cleanliness looking at the resident care uh, doing interviews with residents and looking at the staffing and so they've done their regular reviews uh, and their annual inspections as well as looking at that and complaints the other thing that uh, we that has happened is we were able to procure a half-time 
full-time infection control practitioner to support private the private sector and it's something that they hadn't had access to in the past other than um, through phone support and as well as following uh, CPHO's guidance and so with those we also looked at the enhanced cleaning PPE usage looking at testing and looking at how they're applying the infection control measures on the ground to try to provide additional supports Moving on to the reviews. Um, so knowing that COVID-19 was having an impact in our long-term care sector in 2021, an internal review was led by the Department of Health and Wellness. So what this report did was really provide an overview or a snapshot uh, in time of assets assets and challenges in the sector. So some examples of the strengths are the long-term care sector provides specialized nursing and personal care to individuals that can no longer remain in their home or with their family or with home care supports. And also um, during the, the period of the pandemic, the relationship between the public and the private um, sector um, certainly strengthened. Um, and the province is uh, fortunate to have specific care units uh, and bed types, for example, designated dementia care beds, and Andrew will talk a little bit about that later, complex care and respite care as well. Mm -hmm. So while there are strengths, there are also areas for improvement. And so long-term care over time has been a default solution uh, for funding gaps in other parts of the system, whether that be home care or community-based program. So, but over the last couple of years, um, the province has made um, significant investments in our community-based um, programs, including uh, long-term care. Sorry, including home care. Um, we know <clears throat> one of the challenges is that those uh, who are waiting for a dementia care bed are actually in hospital waiting for placement. Um, currently, our information systems, uh, we don't have them to support the collection and reporting on resident health outcomes. Um, so we do have a plan to uh, roll out um, interi uh, in long-term care, uh, which will certainly help in this area. And we do know that our public and private facilitator facilities operate very differently in, in many ways. Just a couple of examples would be that the private facilities go through an inspection process where um, our public facilities go through an accreditation process that is currently happening um, this week. And also IPAC, Infection Prevention and Control uh, resources um, are quite different uh, uh, between the two facilities. And of course, I would be remiss without mentioning um, that um, health human resources uh, remain um, a, a challenge, an ongoing challenge that we're, that we're working through. And while this report um, confirmed that the priorities of enhancing quality and safety and HHR sustainability are particular importance to this sector, um, external expertise and perspe perspectives were recognized as adding value to the work to inform improvements in this sector. And the current report really provides a bit of a background or a launching point uh, for the external panel to do their work. So now I will hand it over to Michelle Dorsey, who is the chair of the external panel review, to provide an update. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, having me here and including me in the, in the department's presentation. Um, pleased to advise that there has been an expert panel put together um, and its purpose is really to take a, a, a step back and, and look at how the system performed during the COVID pandemic. Um, it is designed to give sort of a broad uh, a objective look at what, what really worked well and where things were really problematic. Um, we'll um, have a group put together. Next slide, yes. Yep. Um, Cynthia Bryanton, um, who is just in the throes of retirement, um, is the Director of Long-Term Care for the province and so has intimate knowledge and experience um, in the public sector uh, environment. We have Blair Corkum. Um, Blair is a community member who has extensive experience as a financial planner, often works um, quite closely with seniors as they're pre preparing for that next phase of life and, and looking at uh, the preparations for that. He also has fairly extensive personal experience um, with family members transitioning into the community care and long-term care sector. 
Dr. Carol Estabrooks is an academic researcher from Alberta and has been working in this area for some time, is intimately involved in national committees that are working towards setting standards for um, long-term care facilities. And Dr. Janice Keefe, um, while she's a born and bred islander, she uh, lives partly in Nova Scotia, partly in PEI. She work, is an academic with Mount St. Vincent University and does extensive research in, in this area. So we're very pleased to be able to bring that group together. Um, the, the key activities you can see listed on, on the slide, um, really looking at what happened during COVID, how did the system identify outbreaks, how did they work to prevent and, and protect um, during a, an outbreak or the community spread, um, looking at impacts of physical infrastructure, how did they cope with um, isolations, with social distancing, keeping <coughs> residents safe during that time period. Um, and looking at things from the legislation, the regulations, policies and procedures um, that the homes, both in the public and private sector, will uh, are operating under. Um, there will be a heavy emphasis on hearing from residents and families and caregivers uh, of the system and, uh, and their partners in care, um, which will give undoubtedly a, mo a unique perspective <coughs> to um, counterbalance or add on to complement the internal reviews that have been done already by the system. Um, we anticipate hearing a fair bit from the long-term care owner operators and other professional leaders in the sector. Um, we have been well uh, versed uh, from the FOIP folks uh, at the D Department of Justice who've met with the expert panel to talk about how we protect privacy um, throughout this process. Uh, we don't really anticipate collecting a lot of personal information. We expect a lot of the information will be aggregate and, and data that we can work with um, that won't require personal information being included, but our work would uh, certainly operate under those guidelines. Um, we have put together a tentative timeline. Um, we have just really begun the work um, as a group and starting to get our head around what it is that we've been asked to do. Um, through May, June, we'll finalize our work plan um, and look at um, how we're going to deliver a report at the end of the day. We hope to be able to do that by mid-fall. Um, with the summer being a lot of information, data collecting, look at stakeholder uh, engagement in late summer, early fall, and then, of course, the analysis and report writing following that. So now we'll move on to long-term care access, and so I'll hand it over to Andrew McDougall, the Executive <coughs> Director of, um, let's see, Community Health and Senior Care that's in at Health PI. Yes, that's, that's right. Thank you, uh, and a pleasure to be here. And I don't want to overstep if it's the chair of prerogative, but I do want to recognize in the gallery here that uh, we have our new provincial director of long-term care. She is uh, come here, comes here by way of Ontario. This is literally day, I think it's seven for her, and she, I think she's been in the province for a total of about nine days. But uh, we are excited to have her on board, and she's in listening mode right now. But it's great to uh, great to have her. Yeah. Welcome aboard. Trying, trying to find that balance, we'll try not to frighten her, but then also <laughs> give her that space to, uh, <laughs> to can be great addition to the team. So I, I'm obviously here, oh, sorry, her name is Angie Hines. Angie Hines, yeah. Yes. So I'm here on behalf of Health EI, and so my comments will be reflective of that, although I think several of them will be germane to the private sector and our partners, partners there as well. So the, the first component here, with the long-term care access. So the, this, this table here shows, because I know this has obviously been a topic of interest for a considerable period of time, so this shows what our current level of occupancy is in our long-term care homes in, in the health PEI as it stands as of uh, late last week. So we have 87% of the beds in long-term care sprinkled across our homes that are currently occupied. The, it's been a fluctuating number, obviously, over the course of the, of the past year, year and a half. It's been relatively stable in that position for a little while, that, it, although there is some levels of improvement happening. I do want to underscore that these beds aren't closed per se. It's, you know, they're more restricted in terms of there's, 
you know, methodical process to determine when it could be uh, appropriate to, you know, move people into those facilities. So throughout this period of time, there's been admissions that have happened across all these homes. That's an important point to make. Looking at, in, in related, sorry, my head's whipping back and forth here as I look at the table. So this here is, gives you us a sense of the amount, of the, the, the wait list for Islanders that are waiting for long-term care. And I'll re remind the, uh, the chamber that this is for all people waiting for long-term care, regardless of where from. And we do have a centralized approach as it relates to admission of long-term care for both public and private. It's a centralized approach. For people come in through uh, one funnel through our healthcare team to, to assess and, and to prioritize in place. And, you know, we, we see, you know, we, obviously we're seeing an uptick. The data is from, dates back from 2017, and it goes up until the end of this past fiscal year, March 31st. Currently, currently we have, of, as of the end of May, we have 200 Islanders that are waiting for placement into long-term care, which is actually a slight reduction of five from the, from the previous month. But we are seeing uh, uh, an uptick that, that's happening. And this is not to any degree surprising. The, you know, the, the population of, uh, we're getting older as a, as a population. We have about a 10% growth in the percentage of people that are 75 and up since, uh, since 2016. And, and, and certainly there's no allusions to the fact that if we don't continue on our focus on building up our community, this will continue to grow. This will absolutely continue to grow and will require more long-term care beds if we don't remain committed to the, the path that we're currently on. So the next slide I'll, uh, is another way of looking at, uh, it's a subset of the previous slide. So this, this is, so ALC, it's alternate level of care. So uh, people that have uh, completed the acute portion of their stay and are awaiting placement uh, elsewhere, whether that's at home or in long-term care. This focuses on people that are hospital awaiting placement in long-term care settings. And this is over the course of the last year and every line there is a respective community ho uh, hospital, community hospital, as well as our main referral hospitals. And over the last year, it's surprising to like, it's the rate overall rate is 20%. If we're looking for an overall global number, how many people are in, in hospital beds that are waiting placement long term care? It's 20% roughly, give or take. In, for, in the most case, with the exception of uh, Surrey Hospital, we've actually seen a slight, uh, we've seen a reduction in that over the last, over the last year. Now, this would no doubt reflect partially the prioritization to, of people in hospital to access long-term care beds as a part of our, our pandemic response to make sure that we've had access to acute care beds. That's no doubt has been a part of it. But this figure in response to the previous figure demonstrate that the, the impact of the restricted access we've experienced has not been quite as extensive as one would expect given, uh, given what's happened. And one of the conclusions we're drawing from that is this period of time, what, for example, what we're seeing in this graph is coincided with significant investments that are happening, in, and Deborah's alluded to some of them. In, for example, in the home care program in particular, we've had $1.9 million of investment in that service last year, and we have another 1.6 that that's happening now. So it's, we're pivoting towards that sort of approach to mitigate the requirement for ongoing long-term care service. More beds. So I guess... Uh, just, sorry. Yeah, sure. I'm um, just going to... Michelle has a clarification question. Yeah. Thank you. So, so when you say ALC rate per month, are you saying that the percentage of beds in that facility is ALC, or what? What are you actually telling me there? So that'd be like an, that'd be an average tally. So on, on the average month, it'd be 20. Per, well, I'm giving you the global figure. If you could plot it against uh, whichever line, that would show you. For example, if we look at the the bottom line there, that appears to be QEH. the color QEH. QEH. So if we look at say May of 2021, that's saying just below 20% of people that given month were awaiting placement long term care. They were they were done at their acute portion of their stay. Hopefully, hopefully that clears it up. Okay, thank you. So I mean the impediments. So tying this back into our occupancy levels I mean, we've got th these here of course pandemic we started a lot we've started a lot of sentences because of the pandemic over the course of the last six months i mean on one end of it the you know the enhanced requirements for safe transitions in care i.e testing the requirements for isolation in facility and, and and the need for to use multiple rooms because trying to isolate people in shared rooms it's re required a lot of it slowed that process down and for good reason based on the guidance of our experts at CPHO and what the evidence was. So one portion of it, the other portion, of course, with the symptomatology of our staff and the requirements for either outright sick or those that were close contacts. 
frankly, on a sudden basis, frankly, really challenged our depth. I mean, in very little notice, we could we could we could have staff that are that are off for various reasons that are connected to that. So, and we, the depth to absorb that is not the same as it, as it once was. So, healthy new resource availability, I think that's apparent. The you know we have we have vacancies in this province. We it's well known. We. We have, in long-term care, 86% of our positions in long-term care are full, are filled, I should say. But uh, within the, the nursing nursing ranks, uh, that certainly fluctuates, and in particular with registered nurses and LPNs and uh, reg registered care workers. And so that's one angle of it, obviously, the vacancies that we're having there. But the the degree to which we can we can uh, count on the, the availability of that, of that staff over a period of time, because in long-term care, it's a little bit different than, you know, perhaps in a hospital setting or somewhere else where people can come and go and discharge. But if portions of our staffing complement is being supplemented by casual support or necessi not necessarily you know, committed or permanent, it makes it difficult to plan and, and to be able to rely on that. Because when residents come in, if you look at our data, they're coming in for three years. And so we need to be able to uh, reliably to, to do that. And complexity of care. The, I mean, that's evidence well. You walk into any of our long term care homes, and if you go in a time machine and do that same thing 10 years ago, and you'll see a notable difference, uh, particularly the prevalence of dementia. And we've certainly pivoted to try to support that. And, you know, bariatric needs is escalating in this province. About 10% of our residents have requirements in that, in that space. So those are significant areas that have, have ratcheted up the complexity. So, um, <clears throat> In terms of strategy mitigate, like some of the things that we've been trying to do uh, as this is, situation has evolved, several things. Of course, it's, with respect to supply on the RCW front, I mean, it's been a wonderful initiative with the, the, the tuition. Uh, we don't, obviously not, won't yet see the impact of that, but that is uh, certainly an important development to recognize the value of RCWs and to help encourage people that are trying to make that decision to dedicate their career there. So that's exciting. The campaign that was done associated with that, and it's important that we make sure it's not a one and done campaign, that's really professionally done. It really exalts what, what they bring to the table. So that, that's been great. The, we've gone through initiatives to try to increase the number of full-time staff that we have in the organization. You know, we would like to improve our ratio full-time to part-time. It's a relatively balanced, it's relatively even. We'd like to move it more towards, you know, 80-20, for example, that's full-time to part-time. So we actually have gone through a process with several groups of staff to offer that uh, opportunity. We are in Health PEI with ex just trying to provide expanded wellness supports. There's been some investments that have been made with our OHS team, with our, our wellness group to provide, you know, compassion fatigue supports to, 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 you know, wellness hotlines to do expanded recognition. And there's various other things that are in the hopper associated with that. And we are taking a collective approach to try to support uh, staff wherever they, wherever they may be to uh, realign resources where we can. In terms of strategy connected with this, and this is where I suspect we're going to spend mo most of the rest of the, the session, so I, don't, I won't get into too much but here at this moment, but clearly a part of our approach is to continue on the path that we're on with respect to building up home care and building up primary care in those areas. It's, it's, we feel that it's, it's demonstrating results, but we need to continue to go. It's, we're just beginning. We need much further to go with respect to that. The Looking at the fundamentals of the model of care and the nature of services that we're actually providing in LTC. I mean, it's no, it's no secret we're seeing this migration from 24-7 operations in particular. So long-term care and hospital as well. So, so people moving away from shift work and the, the, the demands. We need, to, we need to provide an environment. We need to study what, what we need to do to be able to track people and stay and stay in, in LTC because we can get people, but we want to be able to maintain them. And of course, the review that Michelle spearheading is going to be a strong support uh, in that regard. But there are significant opportunities I believe we can take in that space when we look from a sustainability standpoint. And that actually it ties into the, the work life experience. We need to change the model so the staff have a quality uh, work life so they want to come and stay in, in, in LTC. And that is very much a <coughs> fundamental issue. It's a national, international issue. and. You know, it's not going to be any one magic uh, potion that's going to solve that, but it's certainly the number one focus for us. Great. Um, thanks, Andrew. We'll move on to some um, activities to supporting in place to support long-term care. 
Um, so the focus of the federal re uh, safe restart funding was on strengthening infection prevention and control uh, practices in both public and private uh, long-term care facilities. So there are three main buckets of funding there. The first is around education and training, and education is focusing on three main areas, core competencies in infection control, um, uh, com a comprehensive evidence-based hand hygiene uh, program and an environmental cleaning and disinfection program. And uh, while we're focusing on long-term care for the, this funding, um, the education and training would also be available to community uh, care facilities. And we are um, working to establish a, a new quality assurance program uh, in the private sector that monitors compliance uh, with IPAC practices. And it would um, sort of model um, the current program that's in Health VEI. And we would be hiring uh, professionals for that uh, program. And they would be available for both private nursing homes and community care facilities. The third bucket is around equipment and infrastructure. And that's about. Um, uh, purchasing or replacing uh, existing equipment and also specific infrastructure improvements such as windows, air exchange, converting single rooms to um, private rooms, and all of that is around infection prevention and control. There are a number, and um, Andrew uh, alluded to some of these already around uh, workforce um, supports. So uh, we are in the process of developing a coordinated uh, plan for health human resources um, in health BI. The department is taking the lead on that, but working with multiple um, multiple stakeholders um, to do that. And what this will do is create a, f a forecasting model for HHR um, demand based on supply and population health needs. And I think it's fair to say that we can't plan for health PI in isolation. So we need to uh, collaborate and consult with the um, private sector as well. And that planning is uh, underway. Um, and government uh, is working with education um, and private and public employers um, to not only predict what our HR, HR needs will be, but also how to mitigate um, that. And <coughs> Andrew covered a number of those already in terms of tuition for our CWs, additional cohorts for our CWs, RN retention, um, and recruitment incentives, excuse me, recruitment incentives um, as a couple of examples. And I think it's important, Andrew noted the Seniors Health Services Plan, was that that's about a paradigm shift from bed-based care to community-based care, that, um, that we're in year two of that plan now, and it, it, we, it's early days, but we are making some inroads, and so we need to continue uh, to pursue that um, while, con while looking at how we strengthen um, long-term care at the same time. So the vision uh, for the Senior Health Services Plan is for older adults to age well at home um, in, and in their communities uh, and to access a wide range of services um, that are safe, integrated, and high quality. And we're focusing on care at home or close to home, uh, quality and safety across the seniors, um, health services continuum, and again, strengthening our HHR uh, can sector. I just, can I just clarify, you said um, you were gonna move single rooms to private rooms. Isn't that the same thing? Oh, double, double occupancy to single. Yes, oh, thank yeah. you. Okay, yeah. I was just, <clears throat> okay, thank you. I'm glad you stopped me. Yeah, yeah. perfect, uh, Michelle? Fine. Seniors Health Services Plan. Is that the same as the Promoting Wellness Preserving Health Plan? Or no, this, I've never um, seen that plan. Is yeah, that public? It, it's a public, it's out in the public, it's available online. I spoke to that, I think, last summer at Standing okay. Committee. And it really much, it very much is a five year um, plan okay. um, to support um, seniors to age well um, at home or close to home. And uh, we are in year two of the rollout, and so some of the funding that Andrew referred to, it was secured um, through um, the Senior Health Services Plan. And I know the previous presenters talked about um, the senior, Seniors Outreach Team, so um, that funding was secured through the Senior Health Services Plan as well, as another example. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then... Uh, we have some specific supports uh, for private uh, long-term care uh, facilities. 
and um, led by the Department of Health and Wellness. Um, a committee was formed uh, with private long-term care representatives, um, Health PEI, Holland College, to look at how we can collaborate to address um, HR issues. Um, promotional campaign has been launched for RCWs and personal care workers. And um, Skills PEI recently increased, expanded their eligibility to allow more individuals to enroll um, in the respective programs, LPN and RCW programs. Um, and then I think an important um, uh, initiative that we launched in January uh, amidst the Omnicon outbreak uh, was for the department stepped in and to provide it some assistance to ur uh, urgent need within long-term care, private long-term care and community care facilities uh, for staff and those were for facilities that were in outbreak only so that's where we focused our energy. And we do, uh, you'd be familiar with the COVID-19 compensation um, package. There are actually two packages that were released, um, ranging from uh, March the 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2022. And that was in recognition that our private nursing homes and community care facilities um, required additional support to meet the public health measures that were being put in place at that time. And so the funding was for additional staff. It could be for equipment and supplies and also we we provided funding uh, for homes that may have faced um, restricted admission due to an outbreak. So we um, we would provide compensation to offset that loss of revenue. And the only thing I think I'll say about the long-term care um, rates is that um, we are entering um, negotiations with the uh, private nursing home associations uh, association. Um, that work has has started. And I do recognize that the current contract that we have with them has expired. And so what we were able to do for the last number of years was provide them with a consumer price index increase um, annually. Um, uh, and that was built into the contract that we had. If we hadn't renewed the contract by the point of expiry, we would see PC, CPI increases. And that's it for the presentation. Thank you. Um, I hope we made it in the 20 minutes or so. You did a, you did a great job. <laughs> Have a drink of water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And, and didn't speak too quickly. Yeah. Does any of our other presenters want to say anything, add to that before we t open it up for questions? And we have, t we have time, like, so we're, we're, we're okay here. We, we think we do, yeah. Okay, I'm going to we what, what did you say? <laughs> so, okay, we're going to start off with questions. Michelle. All right, so thank you for being here. Thank you for that update. And uh, <coughs> I want to start with the external panel. Um, so last week, government announced that we had an external panel um, with the members of it already decided. So I'd like to ask the minister why you went with an external panel instead of doing a public inquiry under the Public Inquiries Act. That's a great question, Chair. I think you will think uh, as... Um, Deborah had uh, given some details on the internal review. Uh, as far as going with an external panel, and I'm not going to second guess what the recommendations may be that will be coming forward from them, but I think certainly you look at, uh, at the ones that are on, uh, on the panel, uh, the outline of what that process is going to be, over the next four or five month period. And uh, we look, the internal review was, uh, it was a snapshot in time, but I think that we have to remember as well that it was pre-Omicron, where we really saw the impacts was once we get in to mid-December of 2021, and then going forward over the next number of months. So when we saw what was taking place there, and I do have to give credit to, uh, uh, to my staff and certainly to uh, uh, health uh, PEI as well, but just how that coordination of providing services, and I know I'm going off on a bit of a mm -hmm. tangent here, but yeah. I think it is important to recognize that collaborative approach, that working relationship between the private and the public sector at that point in time. Back to your question, uh, again, I'm not going to preclude what any of uh, the recommendations may be that are going to be coming forward from uh, the independent panel. 
it will be reporting to cabinet, not to myself as minister, and not through the deputy ministers. And uh, it needs to be, and it is independent. What those recommendations would be, you have uh, alluded to something there. Could that? I'm not going to prejudge that. Michelle? So I thank you, Chair. My question was, you went with an external panel. Mm -hmm. But the Public Inquiries Act would have allowed you to also do a review. Why did you select one over the other? We are starting off with the external panel. What recommendations may be coming forward? And certainly That's they have the background. They have uh, uh, the experience and the credentials to look at this. And what recommendations, again, uh, Michelle, that they may be coming forward with could it be? Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to uh, uh, prejudge what they may be coming forward with, but what they are going to be, the ones that they are going to be meeting with, certainly if there's further study, further review, what have you, that is recommended, then uh, I will sit here right today and give my word as long as I am in this chair, and I have had the discussions with the Premier as well, what those recommendations that are brought forward, they will be acted upon. So, Michelle. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. Perhaps yes, I'll just add you. to Great. what the Minister um, has, has stated, uh, which, is, uh, um, which is really important for us to hear back. Um, we did take a look at what other jurisdictions um, did, and um, most a, a number of jurisdictions um, had conducted uh, reviews in their long-term care um, facilities as well. Um, from my understanding, most of those were um, around independent uh, panel reviews. I think in Nova Scotia it was actually internal that was done. Uh, so we thought um, an external panel would make sense based on what other jurisdictions uh, were doing and what we were experiencing here in PEI at this point in time. Michelle? Thank you, Chair. So will the panel be able to compel the production of documents or will they be able to compel testimony of witnesses? <clears throat> so that is one thing that we're working right through right now, um, and uh, as uh, Michelle um, mentioned, it probably would be not so much diving into um, the personal health information or, or the data, uh, but hearing from people, receiving reports. Um, so that's what I'll say at this point in time. Okay. Michelle? Does the budget to retain external staff and council um, has that been allotted for this yes. external panel? Can you tell me what the budget is? It's a prox it's it, it depending on how frequently the panel will meet, it's between sixty thousand and a hundred thousand. Yeah. Oh Michelle? I'm, I'm pretty short and succinct questions, Chair. Thanks. Let me just keep going. Um, so how were the terms of reference determined? Um, the terms of reference were uh, developed collaboratively uh, between Executive Council and the Department of Health because we had the context and, and the background and had done the internal uh, review. Uh, and so that's how they were, they were crafted collaboratively. Um, they did have um, legal review uh, as well uh, through a lawyer with executive council. Um, and then um, we did some of the department did some of the developmental work. And then it's the <coughs> accountability for the panel uh, rests with, as the minister said, with cabinet. So we're involved in the developmental process. Okay. Michelle. So you said that the external panel will report to executive council. So that means it won't be public. It will be reported to executive council, which is a very clear difference between um, a public inquiry and a cabinet committee developed under the executive council act. So I would like to understand how you determined why you would want to have a report back to executive council, which would not be public, versus uh, a public review which islanders have a right to see right so it is in our t our intention to release a public report of the findings of the review panel and we wanted it to be with um executive council or cabinet uh to have it removed from the department so we weren't um in, you know to have it reviewed in arms length so to avoid any conflict of interest 
last one for this. Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, we have to. Um, so you're developing this at arm's length from government, but it is a cabinet committee. You've, you're developing it under the Executive Council That's Act, right. which is exempt from FOIP requests. It is exempt from public eyes. It exe it's exempt from all of that scrutiny that those 25 families mm -hmm. who lost a loved one during December to March should have the right to see. Yep. And you're doing that in silence. You're doing that in secrecy. And I don't understand why you're doing it this way and why you wouldn't do it through a public inquiry. So it, as I mentioned, it is our intention and government's intention to make the report available uh, publicly. Thank you, Michelle. And you can come back to that. Rob? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to dig, dig into the numbers a little bit because good presentation there, Andrew, but there's these <laughs> charts and small font and all that kind of stuff makes it a little bit hard. To, and I, I've been duped a few times before in this legislature, so I'm a little, little cagey to this stuff here, I guess. So, so let me get the sense that there's, in, in total, within the long-term care designations, both private and public in Prince Edward Island, there's how many long-term care beds? Because uh, it's the province that determines who goes in those beds, right? Correct. So 1,168, I believe, but just verify that number. Yeah, it's, it's around 1,200. 1,200, oh, okay. It's, I know it was on the news last night, talked about Les Chenoux, where they think they're going to give their license back. You know, there was 12 mm -hmm. beds there, but yeah. let's go with 1,200 yeah. then. Is it? So just by some of your numbers there, you say there's about 78 vacancies, uh, beds not utilized in the public system. How many would be not utilized in the private system? Because you didn't have that number. Yeah, and uh, of course that number is not yeah. easily garnered for us, but uh, it's... We did do a recent check, and again, it's based on an ad hoc poll. It's not necessarily verified, but it was in the magnitude of about 50. About 50, okay. So then you had, you had numbers then about uh, 200 people awaiting long-term care, uh, both private and public, but that also will include people that are at home yes. having certain levels of care. So I sort of get that. Yeah. How many people awaiting long-term care would be in acute care beds? Because that's another number. Once again, no, it fluctuates a bit. Approximately how much would that be? Yeah, like I can, like I can give you the percentage. It'd be roughly about twenty percent uh, of, of of our acute care capacity. So if we about forty, then we could say. Yeah, it'd, be, it'd probably be a little bit more than that. Uh, okay. But uh, <laughs> that's worked twenty percent. So I could have to add all the acute care. I'm a lawyer. I'm a Philadelphia yeah. lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> most most people that are, I can say, most people that are waiting in the community. Uh, most people are waiting from community as that's opposed correct, to hospital. Yeah. It's about two thirds, I think. But uh, so let's just say there's Rob. Okay, let's just say there's 50 <laughs> people in awaiting long-term care in acute care. Yes. So, so ultimately, this is this is a, to me is rather problematic to you in the respect that you're you're putting people in a level of care that's probably more expensive. You're probably putting them in a level of care that uh, doesn't uh, isn't very conducive to uh, engaging the staff to the you know the training capabilities that they're they're doing. It, how, how are you going to solve that problem? It just seems like there's a there's a big big stretch here that you've got uh, you know pretty near 200 people that are waiting long term care. They get no place to go. They've been designated in need of it, hmm. and you really don't have really much of a plan other than saying we're going to try to get a few more people into the into a program. Uh, that you know I'll, I'll, I don't know. I should really refer in that to the minister. It's not fair to put that on you, Andrew. Uh, but uh, can you give me some sense that that's a there's a plan to solve this relatively soon? Yeah, like, I mean, certainly a, a big part of it is is with the investments, to continue on the path with the investments we've been making in home care. So for an example of that, so the COACH program, which is nationally claimed, so it stands for Caring for Older Adults in Community and Home. It So it it is a, a team of multidisciplinary people that are targeted as people that absolutely would be in a long-term care home. It's a multiple range of health professionals, I'm NP, you know, geriatrician, social work, RN, dietitian, like that essentially wrap themselves around that uh, individual and they follow them all the way through. Uh, and, you know, with, and we have some, the, the data from that initiative, the coach initiative, which is being invested in, shows that people that in that program that eventually come into long-term care, uh, their length of stay in long-term care is about 1.3 years. People that aren't in that program, their length of stay is three years. Yes. The national average is 1.8 years. The, so we do have an over-reliance on lock and care, and so part of the part of the answer certainly is okay. We've made some good inroads here in, in home care. We got to keep going. We got to keep investing. We got to invest more in restorative services, respite services. You know, increase the amount of hours that are available for, for people in our home care groups. That's a 
big part of our, our fundamental shift. Other, other elements that I would say that is uh, actually just launched, uh, also in the home care program, is the, the Interi project. And that was a long, long time coming, but this involves actually home care personnel that are trained in evidence-based, rock-solid methodology to define what the care needs are of people, in, including the hospital. So you know, right now where we have a smattering of different personnel that are involved in doing that in the hospital, we're going to have our folks in home care, they're going to be trained with using validated instruments to define precisely what their care requirements are because... You know, it's, it's, been, it's right out there in the Canadian Institute for Health Care Information report that one of, the main dri one of the key drivers for people going to long-term care is actually being assessed in a hospital-based setting. When it's, you know, n not the ideal spot for people to be assessed when, and they're assessed maybe not their most optimal time. So we're investing in that so we can help reduce the level of demands that are, that are happening in, the, in that sector. So... <laughs> well, I'm, from, Rob, I'm familiar yeah. with the inter and yeah. all those different uh, yeah. ways assessed. I'm going to go a little bit more on the issue I brought up and asked the legislature quite a bit, around unsafe protocols. And I know you know this answer because you've explained <coughs> this to me, I think, in a few cases, so you and Cecil Valera. <laughs> Maybe you can explain to the legislature, though, what, what's deemed an unsafe protocol in the health care system uh, under long-term care? An unsafe protocol. The well, you're going to, you get into provisional licenses, but it kind of, they interact together. Because I know I've had, when my time as a minister, I would have the department come in and say, we're in an unsafe protocol in this facility on this particular night. And uh, yeah. mostly because staffing would be the main issue. But there's other cases where eventually a license had to be pulled because people were in an unsafe condition. So maybe you could explain to the legislature what uh, an unsafe protocol would be within your department because I'm, I'm assuming that whenever you're, there's a certain point that staffing levels fall be so, uh, be below a certain complement somebody must know this oh I'm, right certainly there i mean there's i won't delve into so much the inspection portion of this uh, uh, that's related to the, to the private sector because they're, they're licenses and there's a different set of protocols and mechanisms mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Health PEI's standpoint, I mean, there's a couple different ways at it. Uh, there, there's, for example, there's like unsafe works, work site situation reports that are pursuant to OH&S uh, uh, policy that, uh, that people can fill out for any pur purpose, <coughs> um, regardless of what it is. So that's something that would, if staff fill that out, then it gets reported through OH&S and it comes, there's a requirement to respond to that formally through, through, through administrative channels. We have as well, we have a well-established electronic incident reporting system that, that is based on five different levels of severity. And uh, this, re this entails environmental events, uh, resident care events, staff safety events, right. these, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these, these, these aspects. And so it's based on five levels uh, with uh, five being the worst that can happen and one being a, a near a near miss. So so there's, there's clear protocols that are around the responsiveness of those and you know as they get documented, you know, there's a requirement to respond in a particular period of time and to to do depending on the nature of the incident. So this could entail disclosure if there's harm involved. This can entail investigation and review. There's time frames around when that's done. And for things that are you know, immediately resolvable or actionable, then they're ultimately reported up through the organization as necessary. So an example, another example of that, we we have what's called a, we need to come up with a better name for it, but it's called the level four or five uh, review group. So so we have something like even next week that's that, that looks at the previous quarter, what for those level four and five serious incidents, we review what were the actions that were done. Uh, is it good enough? Uh, and the recommendations, because sometimes there's recommendations that aren't immediately actionable. What's the status of those? Do they need to be pushed? Do we need to secure more support to accelerate Correct. that type? But try to keep mine in sight now. Good. Well, Rob? Good. well answered. Uh, so how often or how frequent are these things happening within both public-private systems uh, that you're aware of anyway? Because my understanding is it's happening quite frequently uh, that staff and compliments are problematic. And, and I get the situation in a long-term care facility if you, you know, for say a night shift and you were a little below comp, you're not going to clean everybody out and move them somewhere. Yeah, you, right. you continue operating. It's no different than you would in a private facility with, with a provisional license. But can you give me some sense of, uh, you know, how frequent this is? Is it a daily thing, a weekly thing, a monthly thing in every facility? Or is it just a few facilities, uh, that kind of a situation? Right. The <laughs> Tough question for you, but <laughs> yeah, so you're up to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can stop any time. Yeah. Um, 
I can only give you anecdotal. They, we, we don't have super great data on, you know, every time, for example, you know, we're below core. So when we're supposed to have one person look after six, we should have 12. Or, I mean, they're looking after 12, it's that kind of thing. The, the, uh, it certainly has escalated over the, over the, over the last year. The, I wouldn't say it's daily. I wouldn't say it's monthly either, so it's probably summers in between. That, uh, that we, have, we certainly have sporadic instances at sporadic facilities that where we're, we're having people working multiple, multiple shifts, uh, fortunately, because of coverage limitations and challenges or we need to leverage overtime or things of that nature so it did it, it does happen it is uh, obviously it's disconcerting for sure yeah. last one Rob for now yeah well I guess it, when, when we had the other presenters the nurses union being one or some of the unions they had mentioned that there were stacks of papers in these situations so that's where I'm just kind of getting that trying to, but I think you've answered it relatively well. So when it comes to then the provisional license issue, how many uh, are currently operating on PEI with a provisional license? So I can speak to some of that. There you go. Good. Um, so we have, so the board, so back to your, when the inspectors on behalf of the board go and inspect, the homes uh, are required to follow a, a specific set of standards, include staffing, care and service, number of other areas. And so we've talked about this where there is significant staffing concerns and the homes do provide reports to the inspection office um, on behalf of the direction from the board of staffing instances. And between complaints and instances in the last six months, we've had over 120 incidents that have been followed up. I can tell you that we've had two provision, uh, two um, homes that have had admission freezes, which when there is a, a significant um, concern about care, they often will put an admission freeze in place exactly. while the, it gives the time, the home's time for them to respond to that. And in the last six months, there have been 11 provisional licenses also issued. Um, and some of that is related to the uh, it triggers a follow-up by the inspection process to go in and look at that. So we certainly see a significant increase in that in the last six months. Great. We'll have to come back to oh, that yeah. for now. For yeah, sure. Thank you very much for opening <laughs> that up. Oh, Carla? Thank you, Chair. And thank you for being here today with us. Um, so as I consider this, at the heart of what we want here is for every single island senior to get the same level of care um, in in terms of equity, in terms of health, in terms of all of those things. And so as I look through the budget and start to think about this, I see one of our systemic issues being our funding models between public and private. Mm -hmm. And so if we break that down, just quick math, my numbers might not be bang on, but just roughly. So one person comes forward, they've got for a public facility, they've got $450 and they say, here, this is for my lodging, my food, my activities, my care, um, and to pay staff salary. And then the same person, just by kind of the nature of how we kind of put people into facilities, comes with 200, just over $200 and says, I need the same thing. How, how do we end in there too for the $200 to go into a private facility this person gets. That also includes, if you consider the fact that, you know, private facilities are responsible for the maintenance, they're responsible for building the, the building. So they're coming with that $200, but they're also having to pay for all of those things. Whereas the $450 comes in, it's already built. How do we justify that inequity? That's a really important question that you're asking, uh, Carla, um, and that um, that came up as we did the Seniors Health Services Plan. Um, if you've read the internal long-term care review, you can see the differences between the public and the private sector um, as well. And so um, one of the things I had mentioned that we're doing is entering into um, <coughs> negotiations. I think that will be... Um, an item uh, that will be tabled, uh, that we'll, we'll need to work through, through the negotiation process. Um, and what we've, what we've done through the um, pandemic is recognizing that the private sector um, uh, needed some additional support. We were able to provide that um, 
contingency uh, funding. Now I know that doesn't go on in uh, forever, and it ceased at the end of uh, end of March. Mm -hmm. And I think that I will. The other thing I will just share with the safe um, restart funding uh, that was available from the federal government, um, knowing um, some of the some of the differences between the public and the private, and, and I'm not going to speak to quality. Um, uh, that we decided, um, because in the public sector, um, the majority of the long-term care facilities have been built in recent years, so they have um, a different, um, I guess, a footprint or um, floor plan where they have single beds, they have single rooms as, a port, as opposed to rooms for double occupancy. Um, so when that funding became available, um, we it was decided that it would be best if most of that funding was made available to the private sector as opposed to the public sector. So we have a 30-70 a split with 70% going to the to public sector, private sector, excuse me. So um, what you've said is it's, it's recognized and we need to work towards reducing um, that disparity, um, but that's not going to happen overnight. That will be an ongoing process. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And, and this is an ongoing process. And, and as you look at the budget, long-term care public homes for nine provincially owned manors get just over $80 million. Private nursing homes, which include nursing homes and community care facilities and COVID-19 supports, get just over $37 million. That is shameful. And th this is not new. This has been prior to COVID. But I guess on that note, as I consider the fact, one of the first things this government <coughs> did upon being elected was changing the legislation to remove the private members from the board. And I'm going to, when I ask my next set of questions, I'm going to tie all this together. So we removed the, the voices that represented private facilities from that board. Minister, why did we do that? It would have been perceived as a conflict of interest. Um, did, did, did you look like you wanted to talk? I just wanted to clarify something okay. um, uh, Carl had mentioned around the, the budget funding. Um, but I can hold that if you want, or I'd just like to clarify something. Mm -hmm. if, if you could just hold that Carla. for a second. I will. I will. I wrote it down. Thank you. Yep. Carla? Minister, how is that a conflict of interest when we're talking about long-term care homes? Long-term care homes are represented by both private and public. How is that a conflict of interest? So you're talking about the inspection boards? Yes. That, okay. So if you, for example, have a private long-term care facility, <clears throat> and I'm not insinuating that this has ever happened or would ever happen, but there is a potential of perception there. So I am the owner of a private long-term care facility. I am issued a provisional or potentially could be issued a provisional license. I am sitting on that board that makes those types of determinations from my perspective that is a conflict of interest. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Chair. But they're not, they were never voting members on the board, if, if, my, if, if I understand that correctly. Uh, clarification. That's correct. Okay. So, Carla? Oh. There's a conflict. Yeah. yeah, so while not voting um, members, when you're a part of, of the board, you're privy to all the information that's supplied, and some of it is very of a confidential <laughs> Um, nature, um, and even even though they're non-voting, there may be an opportunity to do some influence, or or um, whether directly or indirectly. Um, the piece I want to clarify was around the budget that was in Health PI's budget. Um, the community care facility funding there was only the contingency funding, the funding for the subsidization of community care facility rest for social development and housing. Carla? Thank you, which leads me to my next question. Okay, Thank you for great. reminding me. I'm going to come back to inspections. But um, so uh, right now, it is ridiculous to me that we are funding this in three different departments. How do you sit together and talk? How do you communicate? So we have started that process. Um, uh, we've had a number of conversations with social development and housing around um, the fact that 
the subsidization and, and Health PI subsidization sits with um, Health PEI, the licensing sit for both community care and private nursing homes sits with the department, and then the subsidization for community care rests with social home and housing. So we recognize um, that that's probably not um, the most efficient way to do business. Um, so yeah, so we've, we've started having conversations and looking at how, how we can write that chip. So I can't tell you exactly what the outcome of that is because we're in the middle of the process of having those conversations, like right now. Minister yeah. is just going to comment. Uh, thank you for bringing that forward, Carla. And we may not always agree, but we do here. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> but to follow up on order, to order, like the process has started uh, between uh, the two different departments, and also uh, we, there have been discussions with uh, with community care and private long-term care facilities on this as well. Yes. So, it's in, it is uh, moving forward. Breaking news. <laughs> Carla? Thank you, Chair. So are you committing to us that eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later, these can't be newly identified problems? None of the, the two things about um, uh, <clears throat> the, pro the funding model and the three different depart or for three different areas funding can't be a new problem. Surely to God, we will get there quick. So are you telling me that so, uh, social development and housing, health PEI and health and wellness, which are the three different funding people right now, which would make, make still, I still am left with the question, how does the left hand know what the right hand is doing? You know, it should all be under one roof. Are you saying here today that it will be under one roof? That would be my goal, but I would also have to add on that. Uh, I think that uh, you're giving the opinion there, Carl, and maybe you Maybe I've read it wrong, but that uh, social development and housing, health PEI, and health and wellness, that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. We do have the social deputies committees that certainly, you know, not only in this, but in a variety of, uh, of uh, issues uh, <laughs> would work together. Yeah. Uh, am I telling you that would be my goal? to have it all under one. I think, I do agree with you. I think that would be appropriate. And I'll just um, oh, add sorry. to what the minister has said. I um, think it makes sense that we, we um, streamline it um, and the parts that fit together fit together. Um, Health PEI has the expertise um, and the resources to administer the subsidization um, part. Um, and obviously, um, Health PEI is, you know, is part of the, 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 the health system where policy, they're operational. Um, so um, that very well may rest with Health PEI, the subsidization component of it, but the rest of it uh, would be under uh, one department. Yeah. Just to, just to add to what the minister said. I appreciate that. Yeah. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And, you know, to get this on record, what a prime example of how governments operate in silos and how detrimental that is to services, right? So I'm happy to hear that. Um, I'd like to go to um, uh, inspections now. So how often are private homes inspected? Private homes are inspected at least once a year. So they have annual inspections. And then if there's an incident or something that requires follow-up, they are inspected more often than that. But at a minimum, it's once a year. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And um, are we sure that these inspections are effective the way that we do them? Are we sure they're... Well, we have a set of standards that fall under uh, with the act and the regulations and the inspectors follow a process <coughs> to gather the evidence which is then presented with examples of what that evidence is and that information is collected by registered nurses and registered dietitians so health professionals and then that information is uh, passed on to the board is there you know i think with everything there's opportunities for improvement but that is the current process Carla? Thank you, Chair. Another discrepancy. Why do we not inspect private and public homes in the same way? I think the short answer is that that is historical. Um, 
and so there's uh, been that licensing process or inspection process and then accreditation um, that has been um, the private um, sector would certainly identify that mm -hmm. as, as an issue um, that um, facilities and health PI should be also uh, inspected. Um, so um, there's been no determination of moving in that direction and health PI does have, and Andrew can speak to this yeah. more, the uh, quality improvement teams that go along with the accreditation. So the accreditation process happens once every uh, four years, but the quality, um, the quality improvement doesn't only happen to lead up to accreditation. So, Andrew, maybe you could speak about your process. Yeah, the, for sure. It's happening now. <clears throat> They're right in our right in our offices, looking at everywhere is right now. So that's that's good. So it does happen every four years. The Healthy Eye is a quality framework. So, it, like every major service area would have a team that's multidisciplinary that has family and, and patient partners that are a part of that as well, which is a nice which is a nice step. So these teams. So when these surveyors come. They, what they do, they will make recommendations, they'll provide us their assessments, their strengths, and things to improve on from their purview. And so each one of these teams is responsible to provide the oversight and execute on what those recommendations are and report up through, ultimately through the executive team with Healthy EI as well as the board. So it's not just uh, surveyors are here this week and we're good to go. It's an ongoing process for, for uh, you know, four year period and it repeats itself. And there's other inspections that happen as well, from example, no h &S from an environmental health standpoint. From, as well that happens but they are different uh, certainly that's acknowledged I, I will say the so your, your previous question about you know the impact inspections or are they effective and and we are in the beginning phases of significant inroads to be able to conclusively address and answer that, that very question the interrise system that we've talked about in home care so we've got significant resources that are now allocated to scoping that out for long-term care and and again I'll just Iterate. Interi is the standard uh, nationally, internationally. It's very, uh, very evidence-driven approach in terms of identifying what residents' needs are. When we have that in place, we'll be able to report nationally and benchmark in a very streamlined way, and it will be able to give more precise sense from so many different vantage points on the outcomes of residents in terms of the quality of care. We certainly have various markers of quality, but to give us a real robust, systematic, easy, transparent assessment of that to in all parts of the health system, private and public, and this project and initiative is for, for the both uh, both of the uh, entities of the, of the sector. So that's happening now and it's exciting. That's uh, something we've been wanting for a long time. Last one for Carla. Um, so when I hear it's historical, it's the way it's always been done. That is, you know, I, I understand you're working within the system in which you work. I understand, but that system is not working. And so my last question right for right now is, so private homes are inspected every single year, public homes every four years. Private homes inspections go up online for the public to see. Publics do not. Why? So the pub uh, public accreditation report goes online. Mm -hmm. It's available to the public. And it would identify in the long-term care sector what the ROPs, the required operating practices, whether there were any deficits or not. Yep. So that is public information. And while I say that's historical, it doesn't always have to be that way. So what, why is it that way now? That's the way it is. Um, should we do it differently? I think it's something that we could look at. Thanks, uh, Michelle. Thank you, Chair. Where to go to next? But I am going to go back to the external panel again. So I've shared why I am concerned about why we've selected um, to do an external panel under the ex under executive council versus doing a public inquiry. So my question is again to the minister, knowing that the public can't FOIP information, knowing that the chair of the external panel can't compel and they can't um, they can't compel a witness to test, testify, they can't compel documents, which you're dealing with private sector businesses, so you're gathering information from a lot of different places, which may work out perfect, but it also may not, so you may not get the access to information that you would want. In the scope, there's no reference between looking at private during uh, versus public, which there's very significant differences between the two. Will you reconsider and do a public inquiry rather than doing an executive council led external panel? Uh, two comments I would uh, make on that. I 
do not know why you would say that the information of the process is not voipable. Uh, the chair of the committee already indicated that uh, both that it is going to be in, in compliance with both uh, the HIA <laughs> as well as uh, the VOIP back to I believe it. Yeah. Michelle? Can I yeah. uh, perhaps <clears throat> clarify um, my understanding of our terms of reference and, and um, because that was a question that I asked um, from the outset. Under what authority um, is this panel going to be operating? And um, I think in the beginning there was, um, you know, sort of broad thinking that, well, it'll be, you know, appointed by the minister and we'll get you a letter and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think when advice was sought on that issue, it turned out that, well, actually the appointments need to take effect uh, under the Executive Council Act, that's where the authority to appoint lies, as opposed to the health minister's legislation. So I think that's the, am I correct? Yeah. yeah. So that's the, I think that's why you're seeing the Executive Council Act there. Um, it's been very clear to me from the outset that this would be a public report, and that it, it, transparency is important in the process, and that um, the authority to get the information you need and report in a very transparent way is what the panel believes its, its function is. Um, the, you raise a good question about the powers of the Public Inquiries Act, and my advice would be that perhaps that would be worthy of consideration to have the panel's scope of authority anchored in, um, you know, particular pieces of legislation, so that the scope and authority for the panel itself is nice and clear. Um, and so, and the Public Inquiries Act is obviously, you know, a a good source of that in, of that power and authority. Um, having said that, I think that it's the intention of government for this to be. Um, not something that's perceived to be um, an Auditor General's investigation into, uh, you know, a, um, a particular incident or episode. Mm -hmm. So that's not our function. Our func function is a much broader view. Um, but I think, you know, personally, I think your, your suggestion has some merit um, that if there were issues with accessing information, then there would be something to fall back on. Um, and so, yeah, perhaps we'd leave that with the department uh, and others sure. to consider. Minister? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that, Michelle. And I guess that goes back, uh, uh, MLA Michelle, to uh, my response originally, that I think it's, uh, like in your first set of questions here a little earlier, that I don't want to preclude or to give an indication that the independent panel, what their recommendations, like it is independent, they need to have that, uh, that independence, and uh, what, uh, what they may be, means that they may be going forward, the recommendations that may be coming forward, uh, certainly I don't want to, even sitting here in committee, to give any indication that there is any type of, uh, of myself as minister or as government dictating to the panel or to the chair what you should or should not be doing. It needs to be completely independent. I hope that you do appreciate that. But uh, with that, uh, going back to, you had mentioned uh, the FOIP and, uh, well, in particular, FOIP, and I'm not sure why you would uh, feel or uh, were you getting that information that it would not be voipable in the game of the show? Yes, perhaps I could help with that, sure. Minister. I suspect what members are, are thinking about is that under <coughs> the FOIP legislation itself, in terms of who's defined as a public body, Executive Council is, is get exempted from that definition. So there, there is a very um, legitimate question, I think, that's being raised about, you know, I mean, if you were, um, if you were 
worried about something, you know, about the transparency or the intention of this panel, then that would be a natural question to ask as well. Did you do it under executive council? So it could be cloaked in secrecy. Um, and, and that's clearly not the case. No. Um, ha having said that, I think the point <clears throat> is well taken and that there should be some, I would recommend that there be some sort of um, checks and balances built into either our terms of reference about how the reporting gets done, that it's intended to be a public report, um, and that those kinds of things. So I think it's just navigating both the power of appointment versus the privacy implications of that appointment and having that clarified so that everybody's comfortable and on the same page. And I think, I think we are. But I, you know, I, I think your questions are good ones. Thank you. Uh, is ever okay? We'll go back to Michelle. Yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Thank so, you. and to that, I would not want us to prescribe to an external panel or how they should function. But you absolutely need to start with giving them the giving them the power to do the work that they need to do. And under executive council, as a cabinet committee, they don't have that power. They do under the Public Inquiries Act. That's why I'm saying the two, because you can't subpoena. I understand, and, and perhaps the chair, if I could just say, the, um, this panel would not be considered a cabinet committee, right? So there'd be no cabinet members sitting on it. There's nothing, you know, that it's not a committee of cabinet, but it's a panel that will report through to. Um, and I, th I think it's important that, you know, that distinction be made and that, because I think the, the panel sees itself as very arm's length and, and, uh, and that the work will reflect that. Okay. Michelle? To the timeline. So four months. Mm -hmm. You, oh, you said, I know, as if, is that the timeline you've been given? Uh, no, we've been, we've been given, um, the goal of having the work completed as quickly as possible, um, but that they understand the work will take the time it takes. So the panel would like to see the work conducted so that we can provide a report in the fall. That's, that's the panel's goal, um, and work is being completed, or I shouldn't say completed, undertaken at the moment. We have the luxury um, and really want to thank and acknowledge uh, Dr. Janice Keefe's contribution. Uh, she happens to have a grad student uh, working with her who she who had to have a, a body of work done for the student's particular goal. So there's, there's work that we're kind of taking advantage of different research opportunities um, that exist through the panel itself. Um, so it is a it is a short timeline, but um, we're hopeful that we can we can work towards that. And if it's optimistic, then it'll have to shift. Sure. Thanks, I, Chair. Just oh, sorry. To oh, sorry. I was just going to say, as someone you know, I've been in the seniors care space for a long time, and like some of the names on the on, like on that panel are coming absolute rock stars in the field of the uh, geriatrics, and it's really exciting that we've been secured such. Insightful, talented people for that. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Chair. That's fair, and yeah. nothing against the panel, but I'm saying yeah. there's thousands of people that we should be reaching out to to do this external review. We have over 1,200 beds, right? They have changed significantly over the last two years of people who have been impacted, especially over the last, and all their family members, and all those people that work in the front lines, and all the unions, and all of the other areas, whether it be people cleaning facilities, cooking at facilities, this is huge. So just to put into perspective, the long, so the Employment Standards Act comprehensive review, they have been allotted two years to do that review. We're talking about, um, we're talking about something that has impacted the lives of thousands of people, and we're saying four months, and we'll have a intensive, comprehensive external panel review completed. Uh, and I wonder if we're doing the doing justice, especially to the families of the 25 people who passed away of COVID in that time frame, 
But we've been hearing from all of the frontline health care representatives in the unions of the pressures that they felt through it. And so I would caution anybody pressing you to take four months because I believe that this is a system that deserves to have a very comprehensive review on this. And I would not want to see anybody not consulted or not participating because there's a timeline attached to it. So that's not a question, but I, um, I just feel strongly that I'm not sure that's an adequate amount of time. And I believe that the families deserve to have that time given to them so that they can see what happened inside when they weren't able to go. That's, Great. I have a whole line of questioning, but I just, I'll sure. take a break if that's okay. Okay, perfect. Rob? Uh, back to my and the numbers thing again, I guess. Uh, so we, we kind of identified that there's 128 long-term care beds sitting empty currently. Now, it wasn't that long ago the minister stayed in the House here. I think it was 103. Yeah. So that number seems to be increasing. And I did remember asking questions about respite care beds, uh, the situation there. And, and you did trick me up a little bit on that one, Minister, in the respect of how many beds there were. And then they said, I think there were, I believe there were seven respite beds or nine respite beds in, in the system. And there was three or five of them turned on. And then I find out there was actually nobody in any of the beds. <laughs> but, but so can maybe update me on the respite numbers? How many respite beds are there in Prince Edward Island? Uh, and uh, how many beds are actually somebody that's in them? <laughs> because I know COVID protocols had prevented people going to respite. So I get that, but I just wanted to get a sense right. of, uh, of that. Because I look at that as a pretty valuable asset uh, in the system and a big need for uh, families, because you're saying we're going to keep people home longer. I went through this myself with my, my own parents, and respite was a godsend that we could get one or two weeks or whatever where somebody could go into respite. So I think that's a, it's a valuable component of this service. Maybe you could give us a little bit of an update with the current numbers, or maybe it's, there's still nobody in any of the beds. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can tell you today how many is there. The, we, we have 11 beds, 11 respite 11, beds. 11 respite, that's, okay. that's the number of designated beds sure. that, that we would have. It's not not every long-term care home. I know. But, uh, they're uh, sprinkled across the province on a regional basis. The, I can, as of recently, just yesterday, actually, we were talking about this, so we're reactivating uh, all four of them in the Charlton region starting next week. So that that's that's commencing. That, as for the other... <coughs> Seven beds. I don't know sure, but the outcome is frankly uh, as it stands right now. But, uh, but so, so, but I, I'm starting to think there's a safe bet that there's nobody in them right at the moment. I mean, give me some sense of that. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I can confirm it with you. There, there, there would. I suspect there would be some, but certainly there would not be fully many. Out okay. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, chair, next question. Once again, another factor that came into play when I was question the minister on long-term care beds, and I, th I think the minister was genuine in saying we want to get long-term care beds opened uh, back at one particular point in time. And once again, I got a little tricked on that one too, but I'm saying I'm, I'm cagey to this mm. stuff in the respect that <laughs> one of the things that happened was is that instead of uh, having, I think it was 3.8 or 4 hours of actual on-hand service uh, uh, for the people in those long-term mm. care beds, they dropped the, the numbers to two cut it in half, that allowed them to still deliver a level of service, but not the same level of service. Uh, so can you give me some sense of how, uh, what are the patient hours uh, that uh, are currently in our long-term care facilities? Uh, I'm, it may be different in every site, but maybe give me some insight in this, because once again, the presenters that were here previously uh, representing the unions certainly have said that it has been reduced significantly, and that some people weren't even getting, uh, you know, baths uh, for four days and things of that nature. So, so six days, four was, weeks. Four weeks. Oh, gee, don't tell me that. <laughs> I should listen harder. But anyway, just to give me some sense of that situation, what are the amount of hours order, that we're, we're going to be able to deliver uh, to actual patient uh, time with uh, the patient? Well, that's uh, it is different in health PI versus. Uh, Private. And also within Health VI depends on the, the care profile within a given facility. I, I will say that the hours per resident day is approximately, in terms of the hours that have been provided, it fluctuates, of course. The, but it's about it's been about 4.5, uh, roughly. The the issue is, uh, or the issues that, that, that are associated with that, like the 4.5 is actually, when you look at benchmarks, and we can, mm -hmm. you can argue with benchmarks all day long, that, the benchmarks that you see in most jurisdictions is actually lower than that. 
Um, <clears throat> but the, the challenge, one of the big challenges with that is, is the manner when I was talking earlier about the consistency piece of the, of the staff and complement. It's the 4.5 hours. Uh, first of all, it's kind of artificially inflated to some degree because the capacity of the homes, like the number of beds that have been uh, that are restricted access is compressed somewhat. But the challenge is, you know, when increasingly relying on casual shifting and fewer people to maintain that, that that's that's why, you know, we see the measures that have been taken with respect to restricted access and it fluctuates based on a combination of what are the needs in front of the residents in that particular home that are in front of you, because it can, it can change, like it, depending on who comes in and what, what they need and and what you are projecting with respect to uh, staff over the, the coming period of time. So, but to answer your question directly, the it is about, it's, it's roughly about, if you're taking on the provincial scale at Health EI, it's about 4.5. Rob? So, so you then, or I shouldn't say you, but the, then the decision gets made by staff to simply reduce the hours if you're in a situation where you can't provide the staffing complement to deliver the service. Uh, you see, see this, is what, this is my big problem with what I'm seeing with, with this whole system of long-term care. It's such inconsistency. It's inconsistency on every level. It's inconsistent with private care, public care, even within every facility. Uh, you know, so... You know, if I was sending my loved one to one of these facilities, you want to get a general sense that they're being treated as equal as everybody else based on the level of care that they provide. And, uh, you know, uh, I would surely hope that, you know, I could get a, a bath every, <laughs> at least every second day. And, you know, here people are going that many days without that, uh, just a sponge bath and stuff. That, those are things that I struggle with. And uh, so I want to get into the, the, the issue with the, the staffing then. So you'd mentioned a comment that the staffing vacancies are approximately about 14%. That's a little different than, once again, the numbers that I'm watching and seeing. I, I, I've seen numbers like 25% nursing vacancies in long-term care and about 35% of RCW vacancies. These are numbers that astound me from my time as a minister. Uh, you know, we might see the odd RCW vacancy now. Like I said, there's a list of them. Uh, and, but you mentioned 14 percent so are your numbers including like cleaners and cooks everybody. and every everybody right yeah. mm -hmm. so so what what are the numbers these are numbers i'm throwing out here but can you verify that there's 25 percent nursing vacancies in long-term care and 35 percent rcw vacancies so i think that's a that's that's more the crutch of the matter you can probably keep working with less cleaners you can't you can't yeah. operate yeah. if you're less yeah. rns right or, or rcws you need that Buy certain complement yeah no, cleaners are very important with yep. the, the COVID, uh, um, yeah, like within, like based on what, like most, like the data we have, would be we would have for registered nurses, yes. it's approximately seventy percent is what we would have filled there, and for LPNs and RCWs, it's about eighty-five percent. Um, okay. That's what it is there, but you know we feel the impacts of even one percent. Like these are these are significant <coughs> and. And we need all, the, in terms of the nursing care, we certainly need all three in, uh, you know, significant proportions to provide the service that we, mm -hmm. we need to. But yeah, it's, it's so it's 85% overall, but those within, within that, that classification. Of course, we're concerned with the retirements that are forthcoming as well. Mm -hmm. Rob? So, Minister, from your perspective, when you see those kinds of numbers, and you've mentioned, as well as we all are aware, that the complexities of recruiting, retaining, all across the island uh, is no different than uh, all across the Maritimes and what have you, although our numbers per capita are far worse in those, in those regards, what, what's your sense of how you're going to handle or, or get some sense of consistency into the system where people can expect a certain level of care? Uh, and, I, and it seems the only thing I've seen, really, is that you're adding uh, providing 100% tuition for the RCWs, which I'd say most of them were getting at least 75% before anyway. And, uh, you know, uh, how many more uh, seats are going to be provided in RCWs? But that's just one component. That doesn't mm -hmm. solve your RN problem or, or even your cleaners for that matter. Yeah. So a couple of things on, yeah. on that. Um, so we do have a, a, a nursing recruitment incentive program. So uh, 5,000 incentive to uh, a graduate. Um, we have recently um, been looking, at, you've probably seen ads for the Experience Registered Nursing Referral Program that offers 1,500 um, to somebody who refers uh, a nurse that uh, gets hired. Anyways, today there's been six RNs um, referred and hired through that program. 
Um, we have been working <clears throat> to increase the number of seats for the RCW program, so just not free tuition. So um, there is um, an additional cohort um, starting this fall uh, up in the western part of the province. Um, and so it's just not about um, uh, one sector, we have to look at a variety of health professionals. So um, with um, licensed practicing nurses, we've added, um, we will be adding 64 seats at Holland College over the next four years. Um, registered nurses will be adding 48 seats um, to the program at UBI over the next four years as well. And um, for the RCWs, uh, we'll be looking to add 64 new seats over the next four years with that starting, you know, now and into the fall. So it's, um, we have to, to I think, address their HHR um, issues. Um, we have to create capacity. Um, so we have to work with our um, institutions of higher learning to create that capacity. Um, and some, Margaret Connolly, you know, um, enterprise ex as an example in the private sector for RCWs. Um, we need to do uh, a better job at recruitment. I think there's a lot of effort taking place on the recruitment side uh, right now and um, bring people in from uh, outside of the province. And I do know every other province is saying the exact same thing. So we're trying to make um, <coughs> EI super um, attractive with some of the additional programming that we're, that we're offering. Um, we have to do a really good job of retaining um, the people that we already have in the system. So our turnover in both the public and the private uh, sector is, is, you know, we'd like that to be a lot lower. So um, we have to focus our efforts on that as well. And, and I think, you know, Health PI has been doing some work in this front. I know the private sector are interested in, in you know, additional um, uh, retention efforts. And they, they do a pretty good job in terms of, of retention in some areas in the private sector. So there's no magic bullet. It's, it's, you know, it's creating capacity, it's recruiting, and it's retaining. So we really do need a multi-pronged approach. Great. Rob? So I was kind of with you when you said 64 new seats for RCW until you said four years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I, I just uh, so thirty-two find... starting in January. So, so I kind of look at. So, where's the bottom here? I mean, here I hear uh, you know. So I went from one hundred and three empty long-term care beds to one hundred and twenty-eight uh, respite care. Maybe getting a little bit back. You're you're a long ways from getting a lot of these positions in place. Uh, Gardam has stated many times, going to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. Where's the bottom? Are we at it now, and it's only going to be better from here? Or are we going to see it uh, more long-term care beds sit empty and uh, uh, inconsistencies, increases in the level of services provided? Minister, I guess I'll start with you, but if you want to refer it to your staff, that's uh, fine. No. Well, <clears throat> just uh, to follow up uh, on a couple of uh, comments that you made uh, previously, Rob, uh, certainly uh, we've both been in the same position with regard to loved ones uh, yeah. and the importance we've both seen it, as so many islanders have, of uh, the importance of having respite available. Uh, with regard to the number of uh, respite beds that may be vacant as of right now, uh, if Andrew had <coughs> stated, uh, but I think that uh, we certainly we can and should go back confirm that uh, sure, yeah. completely for uh, the committee. Uh, and again, another uh, family uh, uh, similarity, I guess, that we have had to deal with. Uh, Rob over the years is having loved ones that were in long-term care and I have to say that uh, you know I've seen it both pre-pandemic and then through the early portions of the pandemic and I would hate to have any staff in long-term care feel that uh, they weren't because they did, they went above and beyond. They went above and beyond even before the pandemic. Subsequent to March of 2020, they really went above and beyond after that time period. And I think that's one of the things too, though, that we've seen in a, and continue to see, not unique to PEI, but right across the country. I know on uh, FPT meetings, I uh, know uh, Rob, that, uh, that you have participated in a number of them previously. 
and it's called comfort to me as minister here in the province. But having said that, we see it as we've alluded to previously. The same challenges are right across the country and in some jurisdictions, uh, to be completely frank, substantially more than they are right here. Uh, have we hit the bottom? Uh, you know, we can't with complete certainty say how many ones are going to be moving out, whether it's RCWs, LPNs, RNs, out of the profession at a certain time period. We can have a, a relatively good handle on it. Uh, we can have a much better handle on the potential retirements. We have to have those studies done, which uh, we are, and I don't know, Deborah, maybe you could elaborate in a minute a little bit on this, but we have to look, uh, you know, what are the HR requirements in health across the board, and not only just in uh, referring to the long-term care sector, but acute care mental health and addictions. We touched base on that previously this afternoon, but also uh, uh, in the long-term care sector, in the private sector as well. So to bring that in and to know what our HR requirements as close as possible are going to be, to tailor our educational opportunities to that, and my feeling is when I say tailor it to it, so if you're looking at your HR capacity requirements are going to be here, actually what you should be tailoring those educational requirements to and the number of graduates that are going to be coming out of RCWLP in nursing, not here, but up here. So that you make sure, because you're going to have a certain amount of attrition and the like. Uh, Deborah had uh, done a fantastic job there with regard to outlining the incentives that have been put in place and that they have worked to a fair extent. Uh, we uh, look back to $1,100, uh, and I've mentioned this to you before, about $1,100 three years for a signing <coughs> agreement or return for service for an RN was, uh, it was marginal. I'll put it that We're way. Not, it we, was, we have to bring it, it was back here. We're going to see the results first, yeah. though. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> no, I just want to, uh, to reiterate on that, that uh, yeah. I agree with, uh, with where you're coming from there, Ralph. We've opened down that road, the importance of it. Uh, and Deborah, I don't know, with regard to the mm -hmm. HR just quickly, yeah. studies. Yeah, that's why I had my hand up, actually. Yeah. So while I was presenting, I talked a little bit about um, the department uh, doing some planning, HHR uh, planning, and that is we do have a, a multi a intersectoral um, group around that. It's led through our workforce development um, division in the department, uh, and so it has a reps from the department, uh, reps from uh, Health PI, um, the unions participate on that uh, as well. And um, the primary objective of that is to do forecasting uh, for our health human resources needs over the next um, 10 years. And I'll just make the comment that um, PEI has gone through uh, unprecedented population uh, growth, um, you know, over, over recent years. So when we do our planning, we need to think about um, what the demand is and what the population needs are. We need to think about population uh, growth as well. So I'm not sure the, um, the pace of um, developing our HHR cap capacity has kept in pace with population growth. Um, I just might ask a couple questions on behalf of some of my constituents. Sure. I, have, I have a PE home in, in my district, and um, I've asked the minister this, and he knows, you probably know what's coming next, is that the restorative care wing, we talked about restorative yep. care, and you talked about how important it was, but yet that restorative care wing, that 12-bed unit was gutted at PE home and replaced with the dementia wing, bringing the dementia population at PE home up to 72. I'm not sure PE home was designed <clears throat> to handle 72 dementia patients. The, the staff are doing an incredible job. My question is, who made this decision? When is the wing coming back? And, and when we're talking about proactive health promotion, people staying at home, yep. we, have a, we have an indication right now that we, we've gutted the wing. Or people going back home. Yeah. Um, Andrew. Like yeah. The restorative care is wonderful. It's a, it's a great, yes. it's, a great yes. it, it, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it, uh, it's, when we look, I think, 
you know, a few things to say on that. The, when we look at the impact of restorative care, like I, when we look at the, the pre-home program for its first few years, it came under duress for its last previous couple of years because the, the acuity became perhaps too much for the capacity, but it could still be remodeled. But the first several years, when we look at, when we talk about shifting to community-based thinking, you know, those 12 beds there, you know, I recall in the run of a year would, would process probably between 250 to 275 people that, that were in hospital that were at that tipping point. Mm put them through a program that in plain language is all about mobilization and re, re supporting you to regain your function to dress to brush your teeth to eat the, that sort of stuff and and so when you contrast that with long-term care beds you know 12 beds great but then those beds are gone for three years versus 250 people you can buy more time in the community so you know certainly there's a lot of a lot of support for that the you know the decision to, at that time to to switch it over the first the, the initial phases of the pandemic when we were of course in a different state of understanding of the impact of vaccines the impacts of masking and other public health measures the the, the focus at that point was to decant hospitals to to in anticipation of the surges that epidemiological data was saying was going to forthcome of significant surges we needed to have the hospitals ready and so when we look within the hospitals, those that usually wait the longest for long-term care are those that have dementia care requirements and, and really have the most adverse experience waiting as well. So looking at the Prince Edward home and actually all the new long-term care homes that have been built were designed based on dementia care principles in terms of having quiet spaces, smaller cohorts, you know, private rooms, that piece. So that's, that was the decision that was made at that point in time. But, but certainly, you know, the, the health system absolutely has less restorative care capacity as a result. The, there was uh, 22 beds in the system at that point uh, before that, and now we have now we have uh, 10 uh, that uh, they're at PCH. So I, I really feel that we, when we talked earlier about you know model of care and, and you know studying what that looks like in LTC, I think we have an opportunity to perhaps even leverage the fact that the province, even with restricted access right now, continues to have. Uh, amongst the top three uh, in Canada for access to long-term care, there, those beds that continue to be restricted, certainly I think we have an opportunity to, re to re-envision what long-term care could look like in those particular areas. The restorative care is certainly a potential. Respite service, respite care, the, even with the 11 beds that we have, even before the pandemic, uh, there's definitely opportunity to expand and grow that. Uh, End-of-life uh, care and developing expertise in those particular areas. I, so I, th I don't think we go back and build just the same old because the, the environments have, have definitely changed. So mm -hmm. yeah. I hope that answered the question. But. It does, and it was a <laughs> tough question. I'm not going to ask anymore. I'm going to pass it on, but maybe it might be in the study. Um, <laughs> so hopefully, I'd like to read about it. But it's really dear, and it's like we move, we move forward at times when we move backwards, and I just I have to I put that in. So I won't ask any more questions. I could ask a lot, but Carla. Yes. I think I only have two more questions. Okay, so the Community Care Board, their mandate is safety and well-being of seniors in community care and nursing homes. Community care are only private, only. Removing two private voices from that board is not right. If we think about the licensing process, or sorry, not licensing, inspection, sorry, the inspection process, okay? Let's say they go in and the thing that they are focused on that is as a result, they've been given a provisional license. Let's say it has nothing to do specifically related to the care mm -hmm. of the residents, but something physical about the building, whether it be like, I don't know, something outside. Um, and it's gonna cost a significant amount of money, okay? I just don't see how we are justifying, at least even if it's not specific owners of a building, I don't see how we are justifying the fact of the large majority of private, I mean, there is no representation for community care on this board, period, because there are no publicly owned community care facilities. I don't understand. Why was that decision made? You know, that's a fair question. And I think it's one of the things that uh, I mentioned uh, here when we had the wrap-up of uh, the previous session is that, uh, from my perspective, uh, will I, as an MLA or minister, always get it right? No, I won't. But I think to have discussions, as we have here today, the feedback, the comments, the concerns that, uh, that you have brought forward, 
Uh, it helps me, just as I had alluded to uh, uh, earlier at the end of uh, the mental health and addictions uh, presentation, to the comment that uh, MLA Zach had brought forward and suggestion. I'm open to these things, I'll tell you. I'm not going to commit to that right here today, but I I'm certainly open to have uh, discussions on that. Uh, I know that we are getting uh, limited here in time this afternoon. Uh, you know, and what's that again, so? Yeah, just to, just to add, um, not answering your question directly, um, Carla, but um, we recognize that it's important to engage with the owner operators of community care facilities and private nursing homes. Um, <clears throat> so we have some processes in place for engaging um, private nursing homes and we are we, we met with community care owners and operators uh, about a year ago um, and we do meet with the association on a regular basis and um, Kelly actually is uh, leading the development of a uh, forum, I think it's happening next week. On Monday. Um, so do you want to speak a little bit about, about so we that are, and the purpose? And, yeah, so we yeah. are meeting with, um, to ensure that they have a voice and to look at the inspection process. We are having, engaging the community care uh, association uh, with owners and operators and the board and inspectors to come together on Monday um, to, and in follow up to a previous meeting around what the inspection process is, what are ways to improve um, the processes, how do we work better together, having clarity around what's included, what's not. So we do recognize that we do need to have that dialogue and we are moving and, and having those things in place. Carla? Last one for Carla and then the um, <clears throat> so I guess I'm, I'm really curious, uh, this isn't a question but just a quick comment, I'm really curious, I know this would have been made under the former Health and Wellness Minister, I'm, you know you say you, you, you know in Health PEI you are, sorry, in Health, Department of Health and Wellness you follow the experts, what the experts are saying. I am dying to know which expert told you that that was a good idea. Yeah. Um, my last question, um, I, Pre having um, private owner operators on the board. Mm -hmm. That, that decision predates the minister and myself. Yeah, we'll FOIP it. Hmm? We'll FOIP it. We'll, we'll get to the bottom of it. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so, well, I mean, we can, we can provide that, but it, it predates us, but we can, we can do that research and, and uh, provide that to you. Very good. Make a note. Thank you. It just Carol, gives the uh, thank you. It just gives the impression that the public is the holy grail sort of thing, and you know, and private just doesn't have a say. It just seems ludicrous. So my last question, I'm wondering if I, if our committee would be able to get a copy of the minutes from the meetings of the licensing boards for the last few years so we can see what, when, when things were discussed and what was discussed. Would those meeting minutes be uh, able we, to be made available to the committee? Well, we'd have to take a look at the minutes to be like personal information in their confidential resident information. So uh, we will check with um, the uh, APSO office to see what we can do on that front. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Great. Thanks. Um, last last present last question. <laughs> um, so I'm curious. So the internal long term care review that came out last week is dated 2021. Why did it take a year to make it public? Um, it probably the bulk of the work was done um, in 2021 and um, say in the last little while we were like tidying it up and making sure that we the information was accurate uh, all the I's were crossed no, sorry I's were dotted T's were T's were crossed so um, that took a little bit of time and um, and staff are you know have already, had been reassigned to other work so we needed to we need to polish it up yeah okay yeah. Yep. Thanks, Chair. And so it's dated 2021. How come all of the surveys for patients and families is all in, and staff's 2017 information, a whole pandemic prior to? So I don't, I don't know if all the information would be from, from that uh, period because we would have reached out to both health BI and private uh, operators to get information such as their staffing um, turnover, et cetera. Um, so the data um, is probably the data that was available to us at that time, like additional data from 2017. Sure. 
Well, it specifically says in here, I can't pull up the page, but um, yep. it specifically says that the patient that the patient information in the family well, contribution that's when is the 2017. survey would have been last done. Andrew, maybe you could speak right. to that one. So that was the resident survey you're referring to. Yeah, that was when it was last done. It's a yeah. it's a very comprehensive labor intensive process to to do that. That we to the because obviously with people in long term care, of course, I'm speaking on behalf of Health EI, that you know we're not just sending a survey. So it's it's a matter of securing resources to literally each and every resident, uh, regardless of their level of this initiative. We called everyone has a voice. Uh, not automatically excluding people that were cognitively impaired because that's what had been happening previously but having coming up with an army of folks and we historically relied a little bit on nursing students for that but to literally sit down with every resident in this province for an healthy EI and just you know comprehensive survey and and to, to get that feedback so we're due to do it again 100 percent for sure but uh, that's the process in 2017. Michelle. Thank you so when is the actual data in this report finalized to like when was the last information so it's dated 2021 typically when reports are written they the date on the cover would represent like when it was finalized not when it was worked on last so I'm confused as to when when was the data up to what what window of time um, there would have been some data from 2020 and 21 uh, so we did reach out um, to the private association um, for um, information from their sector and you'll see in some spots that you know some data was unavailable compared to what we we're able to access through health PI mm -hmm. yeah uh, Michelle the, the minister had asked me before he did have another appointment to get to so he had to leave it for so the, the minister I, I just want to maybe give him closing comments if he okay. does have to leave or I mean we're probably we're very close to the end here so I don't know how you subsidy that we haven't even talked about yet chair and that's the problem with this when when we <coughs> said like we were very clear that there shouldn't be hard time hard end dates on this meeting because we're being asked to force two massive topics into one date and the minister I believe agreed that there was not going to be any hard stops or I would assume that that's what we communicated, that we needed to be able yeah. to ask our questions, and this is important stuff that we need to be at, yeah. able to work through. It is, it is important, but we all agreed as a committee to, to do it in this direction, and we did get a lot done today. No. Yeah. Chair, and we, I, I watched that whole thing. Yeah. I know I wasn't here. I watched it, and there was an agreement that there was not going to be hard cutoffs. Yes. So, well, so the invite to us was two to four. Yeah, I mean, there, there is, there's, a, we can, do, we can take action as a, as a committee. I mean, it's, I, we all agree that this is a very important topic. So is the last one, but we're, we're up against it right now with time. The minister has just made a request to me to, to leave. So I'm going to pass the floor to him if he does have to take off. Well, thank you, Chair, and uh, just a couple of things on that. Yes, uh, the letter that came through to, uh, to myself. First of all, for mental health and addictions presentation was from 12 until 2 o'clock. For a long-term care presentation, stated explicitly in the letter that it was 2 until 4. I did indicate to uh, the chair earlier that uh, I would have to leave uh, by 4 or very shortly after. Also indicated to the chair as well, but yes, I agree 100% that these are extremely important topics, both the ones that we covered uh, from 12 until 2 and from 2 until this point in time. From my perspective as minister, if you want uh, myself to come back with staff members, I'm more than happy to do that. So, great. And just to wrap up, uh, Chair, again, I certainly want to uh, thank the staff for the great work that you do, the great work that you have done in this presentation. Thank you. So, thank you, Minister. Thank you. And I just didn't know if you had to leave personally. I'll give Michelle a couple more ending questions, if that's okay, with the guests. And then thank you, Minister, for coming. I just wanted to make sure that he wasn't delayed in his next uh, appointment or event. So, Michelle, if we can have you uh, uh, fin finish up. and. So I'll move to long-term care subsidy, and Andrew, as you know, I've been asking a lot of questions around that. There was a legislative change in 2020 that was made, um, and that removed exemptions. So those exemptions would be allowing people to be able to um, have their private medical um, costs removed from their the costs that they pay for long-term care. It would also include um, their 
investments. Um, so if they're taking out of their rifts, uh, their long, and that would be removed, especially when you have people who've lived in community care and it's asset based, and they would have had to take out rifts in order to pay for community care, and then moved into long term care, and so then their income looks like it's forty thousand dollars when it probably is only twenty thousand, and all of that was taken away from residents. And families now are subsidizing where government would have subsidized prior to this. And so my question around that, and I know that changes were made apparently last year to, to rectify this, but the changes are still requiring each and every person to go through the minister to get um, approval of exemption. And that is not fixing the issue. So why did we change to put the onus on the families rather than just removing those exemptions in the first place to really truthfully um, reflect their income? Really, you know, in terms of the, the rationale from the changes that were made were aimed to streamline the process to make it, uh, you know, as simple as can be at a very difficult point in time for families when they're applying for <coughs> subsidy to, to LTC. And I know, it's, you know, pursuant to that, there's been things of this nature that have that have emerged that, you know, are legitimate, that, that, that are certainly disconcerting. Uh, I can just express that uh, Health BEI is operating pursuant to the regulatory framework as it relates to subsidy. Yeah, so I'll just add a couple of a couple of points. Um, I, I, again, the 2020 predates me, but I do understand um, that part of the rationale for um, removing those exemptions was that um, the way it was laid out, it wasn't always um, an, object, an objective evaluation, so um, there was some inconsistencies. And so we said, well, let's look at the, I think there was um, allowances for the income splitting uh, based on limb as well. So that was an advantage to um, uh, residents of PEI. And in the last, um, I recognized um, that there are events that take place in one's life um, that could impact your income from one year to another. So there could be a catastrophic event, um, really. And so we shouldn't always uh, rely on the um, income from the previous year to determine what you could pay this current year. Uh, so that's why the most recent change to the, the regs were, were made. And so right now um, we're in the process of developing the procedure to go along with the changes, um, the regulatory changes that were made. And so um, we're in the process of doing that right now. So I'd like to point out though, streamlining those to make it more, was not streamlining for families and residents. It was streamlining for homes and for health PEI or um, the Department of Health. That didn't make it easier for um, residents who were trying to fill out forms and then all of a sudden took, had their funding ripped yeah. out from underneath them. Like one woman that I spoke to trying to stay at home replaced her roof the year before so it took $20,000 out of her investment and that was added to her income and that entire year her subsidization was supposed to be based on the fact that she made that money, that one time removal of her investments. And unfortunately, the loved one passed away um, only a few months into it. But that the stress that that family was under in those last few months of his life, so unfair. So that wasn't done to streamline for patients. That's not patient centered care, not even close to it. It's streamlining for administrative efficiencies and so can we fix that so that we actually put patients first yeah so my understanding is that the primary reason was to remove the subjectivity there was um inconsistent application of the exemptions uh mm -hmm. taking place so it was like we needed to um have a level playing field so all islanders were treated equally um, and then, as I mentioned, um, when I stepped into my role and, and um, the, the, this file came under me, I said, well, there are some things here that we need to address, such as a catastrophic event. And so um, that's why the reg change happened, and now we're building the procedures to accompany the, the reg changes. Yeah, and to be clear, the, the subject, the... Absolutely, it's to bring more objectivity to it, but the streamline as well is also great geared towards the, the applicants for subsidy because what we're doing before was very 
cumbersome. Did, did you come up to, did, did to substantiate your different sources of income, where they're coming, whereas with this process, it's basically line 260 on uh, the, the CRA. So but that doesn't scout what you're, you're saying to any extent. That from the administrative portion is better for them, but, 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 but for the reasons that have been highlighted and the reasons you highlighted, that the changes are coming in before so we can account for those types of scenarios that you're talking about. Just one final statement Thanks. on that. And it wasn't really subjective. You had an exempt, exemption section in the regulations that had eight different exemptions, very specific as to what they were. Is how they was applied. Well, when, again, that's an administrative issue, not the resi not, not residence issues, right? Not an Islander issue. And it's severely impacted Islanders, so. Thank you, Michelle. I'd just like to thank our guests. It's an important topic, and, and I mean, you, you uh, answered a lot of questions, and there leaves a lot of questions, obviously, but uh, that's the nature of uh, long-term care, I guess, mental health. So I um, uh, just want to thank you for coming in, and the committee will discuss, and hopefully um, you'll, be, uh, you'll be entertaining, maybe coming back if we need you back in the future, and you had a good experience here today. Sure. Offering you. the welcome back. Yes, okay. I'm trying. Awesome. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize that. Was yeah, up. And, and thank you, and thank you all for, for your questions. Yeah. yeah. You. Appreciate it. So um, normally we would, uh, we, we'll let our, should I just take a break now, or should I just keep going as our guest exit, I think? Can we just keep going? Okay. <clears throat> okay, you thank you. So. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. So we're we're still live committee members here and thanks for coming in. So uh number number 5 is review of correspondence. Uh we we received a letter from the Department of Finance uh Finance and Department of Social Development and Housing suggesting suggesting a joint presentation on housing speculation with Pat Davies and Nigel Burns and Ryan Pino attending. Is the committee happy to go ahead with booking this meeting for 10 a.m. Wednesday, June 22nd? So it's it's everybody all all together uh, talking about housing speculation, which was one of our topics. Uh, Michelle, am I understanding the ministers are going to be part of it? Uh, no, just those three names that were given. Well, I think we invited the minister, so I would appreciate the ministers coming. Sure. It was useful, I think, having yeah. the minister here today, and yeah, I, think I think that so. the request should be to have the ministers. Did you say June? 22nd, yes, uh, that, that's Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Rob? Uh, I mean, I think, yes, it's good to invite the ministers and we want, want the ministers, but boy, it's tough to, uh, just as a minister, I know, to say that they're going to be at every one, but uh, mm -hmm. we should make that request to be there and yeah. let them decide, and that shows their priorities <laughs> to me if they do show up. Mm -hmm. Great. So we'll make yeah. It's the same chat. thing. Thank you, Chair. Same thing as Rob again. You know, that's in the invite out. But that's what I was going to ask Michelle: is if the ministers say they can't attend, do you cancel that meeting or do you push it off? Do you know what I mean? That's my question to the committee. Okay. Michelle, oh, I didn't know if you wanted to talk. Well, I, th I think it's a question that we've been asking about now since, uh, well, the last time I asked, first time I remember actually was um, March 2020 was when, or even, no, it was prior to that, around speculation and, you know, and it, it is a question to the, to the ministers, right? Like, it's because this is a policy decision that, um, of how we're going to address this. It's, it's not a staff decision. It is how or what is the government policy going to be around speculation? And we've been asking on the floor of the legislature, and I understand we're gonna have, you know, folks come in from both departments to speak to it, but let's be honest, there's questions here when it comes to policy that is up to the ministers to answer. So I do believe that ministers should be here in part of the, that conversation. And we saw yesterday um, a standing committee meeting where there was a number of questions that weren't answered because the ministers weren't here. So as a standing committee, I get we can't compel somebody to come in, but I would, I would strongly ask that, you know, this is new policy that's being developed. PEI doesn't have speculation policy, right? So how are we going to address this? So would it be okay um, if we just... Uh, if we have the clerk reach out to the departments and, and say there's been a request to um, 
kindly invite the ministers or the committee would like to to see both the minister of finance and social development minister uh, look at attending if their schedules are uh, Carol and and perhaps explain that given this is a new policy and oh, sure. the ministers have direct no one else can do that staff can't do that they can come up with ideas but it's ultimately their decision Cut. and I think it, that would be important to include in the letter Mark my, my only comment being the new guy is that the, the, the staff are subject matter experts. They, they are the experts. Yes, they do defer to the minister and all that. So for, for me personally, I would learn more from the subject matter experts. And then as a role as a committee, <coughs> when, we, um, when we submit a report, we would make recommendations on policy or strategic direction. So when you bring a minister in, I don't know if you're going to get their thoughts on policy because they're going to defer to the subject matter experts and, and go back and, and discuss it. I don't like on the floor tomorrow or whenever this happens is that I don't know if that line of questioning will get answered by ministers and they're not deflecting. They just mm -hmm. haven't addressed it in their departments yet. So uh, for me, I, I really appreciate the subject matter experts primarily. And then again, as, as, mm -hmm. as Rob said, you know, minister's time is valuable and these meetings are getting longer and, and so on and so forth. So again, I think we need to get the subject matter experts in as a priority. And if, if we can get a minister here and there, there's, there's, that's, there's no shame in that. But I think we should plow forward on the subject matter okay. experts first. Can I just ask for a vote too on whether or not, just for this one for time purposes, it's a great debate, um, but can we just maybe just ask for a vote on it? Um, just to say if we can, if, if the committee would be okay with um, do they want to send it to both these ministers or not? Would that be okay to vote on that? Sorry, what are, what are we voting on? <clears throat> to see if like there's 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 opposing views on whether or not we bring these two ministers in. I understand Mark's Mark's uh, position, and I understand uh, Michelle um, and some of the comments that were that were brought up. But I I just want to instead of looking at the big overall picture with committees and everything, I just want to kind of look at this specific one with these two ministers, so should the clerk. So are we voting on this letter as it stands, the one that's dated June 9th, um, to have the department uh, people coming in, or are we voting on to have the this letter passed, passed on and resending a letter to have the ministers come in and if they, the, but going back to our original staff. letter. That, yeah. that, I'm just kind of curious as to what I'm voting on. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're voting on whether or not the clerk would, would go at this time. We know this meeting, first of all, is everybody available Wednesday, June 22nd for the meeting? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, at 10 a.m. So we, we, we have a meeting. Now, let's say I was saying, can we vote on whether or not the clerk would send a letter or um, correspond with the departments to have both the minister of to invite the Minister of Finance and the Social Development Minister in. That's what we'd be voting on, to join them in this meeting if they're available. Chair. Michelle? So I would say send back and yes to the time. Strongly ask if the, the ministers can come, but I'm, I am not in favor of canceling the meeting if they can't. I would still say go on. Yeah. So I'm not, uh, my vote would be either way, move forward, but that you know, we have policy questions that we would like to ask the ministers. And to that point, Mark, like this has been something we've been trying to get information on since 2020. So I understand subject matter experts are great, but when it comes to policy, that that is what the ministers do. So, Chair, so uh, another thing, even just timing and ministers schedules and stuff, getting two at the same time too. you you're increasing, you know, again, we want we want people to present. We want to do our community work. So we're increasing the, we're decreasing the chances that we're going to see some certain people in certain situations, and we need to plow forward through the work plan, right? You know, when, when you bring, try to, it's just a scheduling issue. Just a scheduling comment, I guess, is that, you know, the, the larger the group or the more people or the higher that we try to go, it's just going to be more difficult to, to get, get, get our work done, I think, yeah. So... Is it okay? Can we just can we just take a vote? To show of hands. All those in favor of the clerk sending a, met, a note to just invite the minute two ministers in. Uh, say aye. 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 All those against. 
just to have the ministers in? No, just to, to just send them met to, to invite them. The, the staff is coming in. And now we're going to put them, we're going to send an, a, a note out, or the clerk's going to talk to send an invitation out to the ministers. Okay. Okay, so the vote uh, it passes, so the letter will be, will be sent. Uh, or the letter or correspondence or talk. Okay, so the next one is uh, a request to present for international unions of operating engineers. That just came in. How would the committee like to proceed on this? So it was just a, it was a request. Um, we have the letter here. Um, there, there, it had some specific timing, correct? No timing. Okay. Yeah, no, so they're just, they're just talking about coming in and wanting an opportunity to present. Um, that was from uh, Tracy Robertson. And Michelle? Thanks, Chair. And I find this request really interesting because we've, heard about scope of practice for a very long time and I think this will give us specifics on where scope of practice could actually be very beneficial to especially our human resource issues throughout health PEI and I am very favorable in them coming in to present. Okay, that's Carla. And, and further to that point, one of the, with the, um, uh, oh my gosh, I forget the name of the act. And I'm, I don't want to waste time trying to think about it. I just, anyway, Regulated Health Professions Act, mm -hmm. where, where we saw the example where uh, counselors are now regulated, but it's still not reflected in job postings through the province. And it's been like, what, a year now, and it's still not fixed. Mm -hmm. So this might be another way for us to see where are the legislative gaps, not saying that it's going to change anytime soon, but at least we know where those gaps are, some really simple fixes that we can do because, I mean, we should be doing everything we can to help these crises. Perfect. Any other comments? Uh, Zach? Yeah, I agree. If, if she represents 1,100 healthcare workers that work in the different uh, departments. I think if we can work it out in a schedule, Perfect. I'm completely uh, in favor of it. Okay, so that's going to pass. So we'll, we'll, we'll get the clerk to reach out and uh, invite her to, uh, to come into the committee. Um, June 29th, the Department of Agriculture and Land and CMHC are, CMHC are both willing to attend on June 29th to present on in inclusionary zoning. Is the committee happy to hold this meeting at 9.30 for the department and 11 a.m. for CMHC? Um, so it's uh, inclusionary zoning on June 29th, so there'd be two different sections. Um, we'd, we'd have, uh, yeah, we'd have a 9.30 and 11 o'clock for... Uh, CMHC. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, June 29th would be kind of the, the cutoff for. Okay. So, how would the committee like to proceed? Is that okay? Yeah. I see some head nods and uh, disgruntled head nods, maybe. So, we'll, we'll go on that. So, that's good to go. Um, any new business at this time? Michelle? Things. So one thing I've recognized is we haven't actually heard from private long-term care facilities. We've heard from the community care, right, private community care facilities, but we haven't actually heard from long-term care facilities, which was one of the things that we said that we would reach out to to see if anybody would like to um, speak to us. So I'm not sure if there would be a call out there to ask any of those private long-term care um, owners if they would like to provide input or if they'd like to present, but I do feel like that's something that we're missing. Um, the other thing is that we're missing is any workers that are not unionized. We haven't heard from any of them because they don't have a voice. So I'm not sure if we wanted to put out to the public that they could write in any kind of submission or anything like that. I'm not saying to present, obviously that would be difficult, but if they wanted to write in with their experiences, I would be interested in maybe giving them that opportunity. And then the only other thing is, um, there's. We heard a lot today around mental health, and and uh, I was wondering if the committee would be interested in requesting a tour of Hillsborough Hospital, um, to have a look at, like at that facility, or and even maybe the treatment center, but specific to Hillsborough Hospital, to uh, have a look at that facility as it stands. Okay, um, so three things there. Um, so, uh, can we go through them one at a time? So, um, private 
long-term care, inviting them in. Uh, that would be, a, there's an association. That's community care, that was Cecil Villard. Yeah. yeah. They don't have, we did have a union, so. That have people working private long-term mm -hmm. care. So how do we, where do we, yeah. uh, Zach? So that's the, the question that I have, Michelle, is because again, if you're extending that invitation <laughs> out, you know, are you extending it out? Because you, you want to give it the opportunity to everyone. And what if they all say, yeah, we would love to come in and present. And then you run into, you know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's my only thought on it. I was thinking of written submission. Okay. Right, instead of presenting uh, to us, but to do a written submission. Oh, yeah, written submission. Oh, perfect. Mm. Okay, so that would be, just to clarify, that's, that would be a request for a written submission to the private long-term care facilities for input and feedback on this topic. Yeah. So would the committee be okay with that? Written submission perfect. Yeah, okay, perfect. And then uh, non-unionized uh, written submissions, and written submissions to individuals who are non-unionized in working in, are we talking long-term care, mental health? Yeah, mental health. Well, healthcare workers, they could be in mental health, they could be in long-term care. But I would ask that, I, normally when we get submissions and it's public, but I would ask that we figure out a way that that would remain confidential. So even if the clerk could compile those experiences so that we don't necessarily have the, the names of the employees. So, cause there is, they don't have any protections. They don't have anybody speaking for them or anything like that. So I would ask that there maybe be some sort of process around being able to keep them confidential. And uh, I guess we d we've done this once before and there was there's costs involved for we have to advertise and and uh, okay. get involved in that. So I, I don't know. Do you think that would we would have to vote? Will, will we do a vote on this one? Um, or any Rob? Some individuals that aren't represented by anybody. I mean, where do you stop at that? I mean, it's just never you know, I, either you're opening it up to say anybody who wants to write in, but, uh, you know, how, how do you get that message out to everybody? I don't know. It just, I get when you get an association, you get a group or a union that, that you know, they're speaking for their members. Where do you go to draw the line of people who aren't represented uh, by anybody? I mean, it's just... You know, the, what, the, what, then we get into the private individuals that cut the grass at that site, or you know, where does it end? I guess I don't know. Just okay. Is this something, Michelle? Would we be okay to think about it and talk about it next week? Okay. Yeah. Would that be okay with the committee? Um, and what about the tour? Would you like to just think about it too, and then talk about it next week, or uh, Rob? I'll say my comment on the tour. It's quite a sight. Eye opener. I've seen it. I there's nothing I want to see again in it, but uh, so I'll probably say I don't feel it have to go. But if anybody else, uh, it is an eye opener. <laughs> I think it's a. I think it's a good idea. Right. Um, Mr. Carl. Here we go. I mean, if everyone wants to think about it, that's fine. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I I would I would definitely be be open for for that I think it's it's good I don't know I've never gone on a tour as a committee I don't know what it's if that happens a lot I think it's been done before oh yeah we've done yeah, it with yeah. agriculture we've done yeah. it with yeah, yeah. Okay. climate change special sure that's where it's good no matter what it is but on the other side of it you're like say the time commitments you're getting into here with all yeah. this stuff uh, and I can tell you what you're going to see is an eye opener but you know th these are what the solutions are you've already there's nothing we can do to change that sure Okay, so um, uh, can we, can, do we just, can we vote on the tour? What? Zach? Why don't you just, why doesn't our clerk, if that's possible, set up the tour, give, set a date, it's this day, if you can make it, you can make it, if you can't make it, you can't make it. Yeah. Let's do that then, thanks for the suggestion. Would that be okay? You know, I think, like yeah. yeah. It's fun to go together, it's bonding yeah. moments. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, is that okay for new business? Okay, great. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Uh, Zach Bell, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.